Welcome, everybody. Um, this is, I know, not the preferred format or forum, but it's only going to be this this week because uh, my doctor's advice was seven to 14 days, and it, uh, I'm about, I can tell, halfway to full recovery. So uh, I will be there in person, as we all prefer to be, at 7 or 8 Anna Lee Hall next uh, Wednesday, but I didn't want to just not have this class. It's an important class because we're going to cover Michelangelo. Uh, actually, no, Da Vinci. Michelangelo's next week. Uh, da Vinci, pretty important person among other famous Renaissance artists, and also talk about how to write your papers. So let me do the um, speaker view here. Uh, okay, we got good. Yeah, so first, any questions that you might have? I don't moot, mute, moot. <laughs> it's a moot point. I don't mute my students because I think that in, on Zoom I'm talking about, and this is, like I said, the only time this semester, unless some act of God comes along and forces us not to have an in-person class at the campus itself. But I doubt that <laughs> unless, you know, weather might, might, might do that, but I doubt it. Let's keep our fingers crossed. So, so only for this week we're doing this Zoom procedure, and uh, it is new to some of you. But I was assured. I checked in with uh, the department uh, secretary, who is very knowledgeable, helped set up some of these programs for the college when we went remote in March of 2020. Two years, almost two years ago. She said, yeah, students are informed. I hope this is correct, they, that she told me that all students are informed that they need to be able to function on Zoom because it's the preferred uh, distance learning platform, I think is the word, at SRJC. So if we've got maybe a few people that didn't make it tonight, uh, the good news for anyone who you know, either isn't here tonight or somehow wants to just review this is it, it will be recorded. There'll be the only lecture it is being recorded and it will be posted, I mean, on YouTube uh, by Friday evening, usually by 8 p.m., if not sooner. And I will send an email to confirm that once it's posted. Uh, but you can count on looking, say, anytime after that, you know, later on Friday or over the weekend and, and, and see the lecture again. And of course, for review purposes for the midterm, that could be very useful. Okay, yes. Thank you, yeah. It, <laughs> I, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy is an old phrase we used to have in Chicago <laughs> where I grew up, you know, as kids kind of dissing each other in the you know, pl playground, uh, middle school period. Uh, it just, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's better today. It, it was not for about four days in a row. It, it wasn't feeling good, but yeah, it happens. It, it tends to, I mean, it happens. It, it takes, it happens that it will be first night. I thought I won't get any sleep. The doctor told me that in case any of you ever had this, I'll keep it brief, like 30 seconds. You'll have one bad night and then the pain will go to the side. Opposite, the exact opposite is what happened. I had very little pain the first night and I thought, oh good, I got to dodge a bullet here. And now second night, worse, third night worse. And then it stayed like that for about uh, three nights. And it's now it's subsiding and I can tell it's, it, it, it's, it's normally healing. So next Wednesday, I will see you all in person. I may be limping for part of the evening, but that's not the point. I think you all deserve what we all want to have, which is a face-to-face -face in person or mask the mask, half face to half face uh, experience, because of course, that's what you signed up for. So in a way, I'm kind of apologizing for the fact that, but I ask about waiting till spring break and the doctor said, do, do not do that. You'll have an infection, ingrown toenails, of course, then get more and more painful and potentially infected. So I did what I think that was the only choice I had. Okay, enough on that. So would you all take out, because I sent this to all my students in all three classes, right, of uh, the five requirements. Let's do that first, because that's going to tell you how the papers should be written. Okay, five requirements uh, handout, plus I sent everybody a sample paper. Now, this was just recently. Well, since we went online, well, I used to do it. That's right. Hard copies. I'd ha pass them out class. And people would keep them, and that was cheating because they shouldn't have an advantage over their fellow students. I used to use the same set of papers. It took a year or two to collect enough for a whole class of 35 or 45. In the old days when that room, 708 Annalee, that we're in was full and there was a waiting list. <laughs> Enrollment's down everywhere, not just in the Bay Area or at the JC level, but uh, colleges, all, well, at least at the community college, city college, and some state university classes. So I've been told by uh, the administration, we, we have been told. 
I don't know, probably Omicron and who knows what other factors. But for you hardy people who are here now, this will be a nice, uh, helpful uh, step. We're going to do that right before we start the slides. Once I've gone over the five requirements, I'll explain how you should be able to just read this. You know, it doesn't matter to me if you do it online uh, from the a PDF I sent of it. It's a three page paper with a cover sheet. You will get a cover sheet from me, but it's too early to send it to you. That's six, the sixth week of class. So I'll send it the week before the papers are due. That would need to be attached electronically, of course, uh, or, or no, I meant not electronically. See, I'm skipping a beat. You guys are the in-person class. It will need to be printed out and attached to papers because I do prefer grading because I can make more comments and I can get more details. So can the readers and you get more feedback. It's a better way to go. Plus I know definitely whether or not you turned your paper in on time because I checked them in the night I get them on the due date. Okay, which is three weeks from tonight. So we'll go over these two things, but first, uh, the first of the two is this. So hopefully you have this out near you and uh, you can ask any question that comes up as we go uh, over these five requirements for your short papers. Um, okay, first, number one, everybody sees that. Uh, you must have at least, I'm gonna try to adjust this a little bit. <laughs> you must have at least one full page each on both, and I capitalize that and I'll tell you why, on both the meaning and the formal analysis. Please keep these two sections separate and label them. If you don't do that, it could get confusing for me or the readers to know which of the two methods of analysis are you talking about? Is it the meaning or do you, and don't mix them up, uh, intersperse them. That's, that will not work well for either us as uh, the graders, me and, the, uh, and any of the readers. And I always grade at least one of the, each person, each student's two papers and at least one of the exams and alternate that with the reader. So you'll get feedback from more than one source and it'll all be fair and objective and accurate as long as you follow these rules. Um, and if you can have this next to you, I recommend you, you have it next to you when you're writing your paper or at least before you finish it and ready to turn it in so you can see like a checklist. You know, did, you, did you do everything on this list? Sorry, I've got to keep my foot elevated and I've got to not bang it into the corner of the table my laptop sitting on. <clears throat> Neither one would be good if I forget to do it. There we go. Okay, so that should be straightforward, but some people don't, you know, focus on that part of the assignment of the requirements. They'll, for, I'll give you a quick, quick example of how uh, an error that could cost someone a whole grade, even before we start grading your paper. You might give me a, a the requirement is two to five pages, right? That's already in the syllabus. You, you all know that. The minimum you can do is two pages if you want a decent grade. And usually A papers are a little longer. But you don't need to do more than five. I mean, please don't give me 10 page papers. Seven would be the maximum that uh, you might choose if you're really waxing eloquent about the topic you're writing on. But usually three to five is what you, most A papers are. So what if someone gives me, let's say three pages and they go really into depth in the formal analysis on the first two pages and then maybe even part of the third page and then the deadline's hitting and they look at the, and they, oh, oh, I got to finish up and turn it in tomorrow. And they just give me half a page on the meaning. And you already dropped a grade before I even start grading because that doesn't meet the requirement. The reason is very straightforward. I just gave the same set of instructions to my afternoon class. And the good news for you guys now uh, is that I hadn't thought of one extra clarification that isn't on this handout. It's not a requirement. It's a clarification of this requirement. So let me give you that now. When we say a full page, well, it is number two, they go together. So let me do that and then I'll give you the explanation that will even further clarify what, what I mean by these two requirements. So number two and number one are, are in tandem, of course. What do we mean by a full page? Well, in a college level research paper, that means a double spaced 12 point typeface at least 23 lines for each page. It's a simple formula that, um, uh, you know, it, 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 you don't even have to do a word count. Like word count is, is not as relevant because words, you know, can, some words are so long, they can fill up, you know, five or six words could be a whole line and other, other lines have, you know, 20 words to them. So we don't do word counts, don't need to, we do line counts, me or the readers that are grading your papers. And 23 lines is pretty easy. If we eyeball it and we can see, oh, it goes well over a page for each of the two sections, the meaning and the formal analysis, we don't need to do a word count or I mean a line count, sorry. 
Um, <clears throat> but if it's clear or seems likely that it's a little under, I'll give you a good example. A lot of people um, will try this and I'm sure nobody in, in my classes has ever done this. They'll start the first page about six lines down, you know, put their name and then it's fine. That's good at the top in the upper right corner. And then the title of the paper, the artist, and then go drop another two. So by the time you start writing on the first page, you've already got a third of a page that's not part of the paper. And then if that only goes to the bottom of that page, that is not a full page. So we would count the number of lines. Don't need to get too technical or mathematical about it, but it's a simple mathematical equation. I hope everyone knows how to do percentages. If you don't and you want to grade papers for any professor, you probably will need to know that. It's simple. You take a calculator, you do the division. Oh, I see. This student gave me only 80% of a full page on the meaning or the formal analysis, or perhaps both. Then you deduct that portion of points from the total possible points. It's pretty, it's a very objective, not subjective uh, system. So just make sure you count the lines if you don't want that to be an issue or to have points off for not having a long enough section on both of the two halves. Now, here's the clarification on meaning. I said this, I think, the first night of class, but you know that wouldn't be something I'd expect you to remember. There are several ways to analyze meaning. Sarah Gill's book does go into this in detail. That's why I like students reading this before they get to the point where their first papers do that. You should be able to have finished the chapters on how to write uh, very clear instructions. But just as a summary or a synopsis of what are the main ways to analyze the meaning of a work of art, I've been doing them in class, but I'll. Uh, elaborate just a little. One is the uh, context, you know, where and what, from what period and what culture did that art come from? That's an important part of the meaning. You don't have to describe it, but let's say you don't know the artist. If you're writing about ancient art, a lot of, we have no idea who the artist was. If you can find the artist's name, then that's a really easy and clearly <clears throat> relevant thing to add is something about the artist. You know their, their life, their 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 career, a little bit about that. What topics they liked to uh, depict in their art. So that's the second category. Something about the artist's background, and then the third, and most important. And if you don't do this, you get points off, no matter how many other aspects of meaning you include. What is the story or the meaning of that individual work of art? What is the message I meant to say that, that the artist is trying to convey? And usually it's direct and obvious, but you sometimes have to do research about the artist's intended meaning, intended message or story, if they're telling a story as many paintings, of course, and sculpture do. Uh, if it's a building, then it's the purpose the building was built for, the function. Uh, and then the fourth category is style. What style is the uh, art in? Uh, whether it's, you know, again, a painting, a sculpture, a building, um, any visual art, usually yep, I'm always going to have some kind of a style. And in this class, we always discuss that at least briefly when I give you the lecture notes about the meaning. But you, of course, will need to research that for sides that aren't uh, from this class. You know, you can write about any work of art. Everyone knows this, I hope by now. Any period, any artist, any style, except your own. It doesn't have to come from the periods we cover in this class. Now there is a fifth category, but it's a little less clear for some students and yet you could do this. It's called iconography or the use of symbols. With Renaissance painting, we covered this, you remember last week, there are a lot of symbols. So that's part of the meaning too. So then you've got, like, you see there's almost, actually it's five different approaches to meaning, but the minimum you need to do is two of them because you're gonna need to describe the story or scene, you know, uh, or, or the message that the artist is conveying in that work of art. And then usually the second easiest one to include in the one or more full pages on meaning would be something about the artist's life. And that's usually enough. You can get an A if you fill up uh, two, uh, I'm sorry, I meant a full page or more with just those two. But, but you might also want to include the style or the historic context and maybe symbolism if, if there's a lot of it in the work of art you're writing about. Okay, let's pause. Any questions about anything I just said, the first two requirements? Anybody? I'll ask again before we finish, of course. 
All right, let's then uh, do the third one. This is pretty straightforward. Illustration. I don't need to keep holding this up, right? <laughs> you guys should all have this in front of you. But the illustration is, uh, is not always a slam dunk. You get 10 points for submitting a color illustration, but it needs to be big enough for me or the readers to see the detail, at least four by six. Anything much smaller, we can't see the modeling or texture, the line, whatever. Uh, and it needs to be in color, okay? Of course, the obvious exception, I put it right there on the page under number three. If the original work of art was in black and white, of course you tell us that, otherwise we won't know. Then of course your illustration will be also in black and white. Now, oh, clarity isn't important though. I put it right there, they must be clear and in color and at least that page. That last one is where people lose a lot of points. Uh, not everybody, but almost everyone has, has printer problems or whatever, uh, image transfer issues. I don't know, you know, somehow I'll get papers every, you know, class and every semester, it's just inevitable, where either the colors distorted, the kind of off, you know, purple or yellow on everything, that's points off right there. Uh, you get partial credit if you submit an illustration and it's large enough. But if it's not, you know, accurate, reasonably good quality color and or if it's not, sorry, I got to move my leg. Sorry. <laughs> Just take a moment. Uh, or if it's fuzzy, that's not going to work. I mean, if we can't see the modeling and the submitted texture and the lines. Uh, so it needs to be sharp, clear quality before you submit it, double check that. If you can't do that, well, then you might still get an A minus if you did everything else perfectly. Uh, it would be just several points off though. So why have that uh, risk if you can make sure before you turn your paper in that the, uh, especially with a hard copy, you should be able to tell, is this meeting the requirements? Okay, I don't think that bears discussion. Pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. Number three? Yes. All right, the next two might take a little more uh, explanation. Number four, bibliographies. A lot of people mix up bibliographies and work cited. They are not the same thing. Okay, so let's clarify how that they differ. Bibliographies must include at least three new sources, including, no, besides Stockstead and Gill. So if you want to include either one or both of those, plus meet this requirement, you're gonna have, if you use both the required texts, which aren't a new source, you'll have five sources in your bibliography, which is a list, a detailed annotated list of the sources you cited. We'll get to how to, you know, the way you know to cite them correct. I mean, so oops, list, list them correctly in a, in a moment. But we also require, uh, or in this class and many other art history classes at the JC, there's, uh, at least they used to, I assume and still other teachers do this too, that at least one of the sources be um, from a print source. Now, the libraries on campus, both campuses are closed. Your public library is open, but I'm not requiring you to go to a library or even go to any buddy's house, your own, or anywhere else and pull books off a bookshelf that might relate to the meaning of your, of, your, of your topic. But I do want you to find a source that was originally print. And I'll explain the reason for that in just a moment. So how do you do that? It's pretty simple. A good, easy one is Encyclopedia Britannica. I hope everyone knows that's one of the most authoritative worldwide respected sources for research. And they print both print editions originally, and then the same editions go online, an online version. So that's what you'd say, originally print or an original print source. I wrote that out here, right, right here on this. Let's see, whoops. Hi, uh, we, we were just getting to the requirements for your short papers. Um, I, I can't go back and redo the ones everyone's heard. We're on number four. See this handout, uh, Jonathan? If you, if you, you should have that because I sent it through the regular email to everybody. So it's a one page thing. Hopefully you printed it out so you can follow what we're doing. We're on number four. So with the bibliography, you're gonna have three new sources. If you don't use Stockset and Gill, you just have, you can have more if you want. A lot of people do, but three is the requirement to get um, full points for the bibliography one of which must be originally a printed source. And you just write that in parentheses at the end of that site uh, of that source in your bibliography from original printed source or an original printed, whatever, but, uh, encyclopedia or a book or ma I'm sorry, magazine uh, or a newspaper article. Almost all of those have both print. 
the ones I'm familiar with, the ones that would deal with art, I think they all have it, almost everyone had to, even before the pandemic, have an online version of a monthly or weekly magazine or daily newspaper. So if you get information from one of those sources, it should be easy to remember. Don't forget, if you don't say it, we won't know for sure if, if it was originally a printed source originally from a print source. It, it's very simple. Okay, but here's um, <clears throat> where people get confused. Uh, you need to label it a bibliography. It's got to be at the end of your paper, right? It should be pretty straightforward. And then it's not works cited. Now, if you label your bibliography incorrectly, I'm not gonna take points off the first time, but you should do correctly college research paper standards and pretty much bibliography is, as I said, a, a list describing the sources you used. Whether you quoted or cited them is a separate issue. That's where you do in the text citations. And those number five, okay, so we'll go to the last item on the requirements, can be in either of two formats. Uh, yeah, footnote. You all know how to do footnotes. I got to believe that, right? You wouldn't have gotten out of probably high school, right, without that. So that's at the bottom of any page where you have a number and at the bottom is the full information about that source you took. Why do you do that? When? I mean, sorry, when do you use footnotes or in text citations? I'll say the other uh, version of in text citation in a minute. You do it anytime you have a quote. You're supposed to do it every time you have a quote. Minimum requirement, I put it right here for this to get an A in this paper is at least two different sources. Pretty reasonable. In fact, uh, I've been told I'm too lenient on that by some other teachers. I should make you cite all, I mean, in text citation, use the sources from the whole bibliography. But that's not a requirement that I think is really reasonable. Yes. Yes, everybody see that? Jenna, yes. It's, 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 so it's, it's an annotated it, bibliography. Yeah, and it's a list, annotated list at the end. And I will get in a minute how to. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted but to clarify. You're right. Okay. No, you said it exactly right. Everybody saw that Jenna's uh, post there, or whatever it's called, <laughs> chat. <laughs> I don't know what those are called. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll notice, yeah. It's a nice feature of Zoom that it allows us to do that, communicate in the midst of a lecture. Okay, so then. Traditional footnotes are acceptable, but most people might rather, because they are cumbersome, just do in-text citations. And that would mean you can put the, the uh, author's last name in a parentheses, comma, the page number from which that fact, you know, like a date <coughs> or any quote came from. I'm not gonna take points off because this is an ending composition class. It's an art history class. If you have a quote where you didn't cite it, but it's it's not a good habit to get into because in other classes, you'll get points off and, and lower your grade for that reason alone. So you should always cite where you've got quotes from. Now, what other types of sources could you use besides a book, a magazine, a newspaper, uh, an encyclopedia, uh, or a website? Now, if it's a website, uh, how do you do the in-text citation if you don't want to do a footnote about it? We make it pretty simple. You put the website and then the title of the article. Don't just give me Wikipedia. By the way, I know a lot of people, students recently, last semester even were telling me, oh, I didn't know we could use Wikipedia. I have a professor at so-and-so or maybe at the JC that same semester even who said, don't use Wikipedia, it's not reliable. I'm sorry, I don't think that's an accurate statement. In any case, in my class, it's acceptable. Why? Here's why. Wikipedia used to be very unprofessional and post any damn thing in, pardon my French, anybody wanted to put on and guess what? They got sued and lost big time in court over a false claim to get this, that Ted Sorensen, a lifelong childhood friend of John F. Kennedy, right? This president was assassinated, was involved in the plot to assassinate Kennedy. It was total BS. And guess who posted it? And it was not fact-checked, obviously. One of the former assistant researchers or you know, assistants in that office of speechwriter's office while Kennedy was in the White House, he wasn't doing his job, so he got fired by Ted Sorensen. And so decades later, this doofus decides to try and get revenge by trying to smear a well-respected historian and speechwriter's you know, record decades after the event. And of course, Sorensen, Ted Sorensen sued 
Wikipedia, and he won a huge judgment, 10 or 15 million, I think it was in that range. I mean, this is like when the website was fairly new in the early aughts. And uh, the uh, inter the founder, is that what they're called, who started the website, isn't that right? The founder, I don't remember his name. To his credit, he learned a lesson and he admitted he deserved that lawsuit and the loss. And by the way, if you're curious, what, what happened to the money? Ted Sorensen was already rich. He didn't do it for the money. He did it to make a point. And then he turned around and gave the money to journalism schools in inner city uh, and minority neighborhoods all over the U.S. That's that's what you call giving back. He wasn't doing it to make money. He was doing it to make a point. And the point was well taken because Wikipedia never did that again. You know this if you use Wikipedia. You look at the bottom of any article that is posted and you'll see multiple sources verifying and you could go check them yourself. That's as good a standard as any website could have. They didn't used to be. They learned from mistakes. After all, we're all human. People have to, you know, grow in their professional capacity. And, and, and I give Wikipedia high marks for that reason. So it's perfectly acceptable, but don't only use Wikipedia if you're going to use uh, two of your three sources, could be uh, internet. Try to vary it. But if you do only two Wikipedia sources, but two different articles, that'll count as, and then one printed source, that, that meets the requirement. Okay, any question on that? Because there's one more thing to say about this. And then uh, I will just briefly show you the cover sheet for that sample paper I sent you all before we get started with today's first slide. Any questions? Excuse me, a little caffeine here. <laughs> about anything I just mentioned. Okay, last thing about, um, let's see, Jenna, you, you brought this up. Um, <clears throat> at this point, when you have a bibliography, you should use MLA format. That's actually mentioned at the end of uh, the requirement number four. How do you know what that is? Oh, I'm not gonna sit here and give a seminar on that. We never get to tonight's lecture and it's not necessary because you can find that if you don't already know how to cite a book correctly and completely in a bibliography uh, or a magazine or a newspaper article. Uh, or what other sources, by the way, can you uh, think of besides uh, print sources and internet sources? Anybody? For general reasons? articles, peer review general articles. I don't know if that would really apply to art, though. Say that again. I was going to say usually credible sources like peer review general articles, but I don't know that well, you find those on right. art. You know. Yeah, I, I was thinking of something in a broader uh, media, non text related media. Source. Video? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, a documentary. Uh, a video, a movie, even that's you know reasonably accurate. You, you want to pick you know re reputable sources, uh, right? Not conspiracy theorists, whatever they they're peddling these days. The point is that you you can tell if it's if it's you know a History Channel documentary with really well known experts on that subject, that type of art or something. That's a mm. perfectly good source. But it's not the same way you cite that in your bibliography, or you, sorry, I meant to describe it or uh, annotate. So how do you know how to correctly list in your bibliography all these different types of sources? Another one is lecture notes, including my own from my own class or any other class you ever took. Uh, lecture notes are a perfectly good source or an interview with the artist. That's a fun one. If you can find the artist and usually artists are happy to be interviewed for college research, well, at least many of them are. Anybody ever see Pearls Before Swine, the comic strip? It's wonderful with the animals that are all kind of neurotic and yeah. He lives in Santa Rosa and uh, he came as a speaker to my class, but then afterwards some students cited some of his work as one of their, uh, in, in their papers for, for this, it's a summer class I was teaching. And uh, he was happy to answer their questions online. Uh, so that could be, you know, an interview online or, or with, you know, on the phone or even in person. So how do you cite those different kinds of, or list those, sorry, to describe them in your bibliography? You go to either noodlebib.com. I literally can't say it any more plainly, but I'll slowly spell it. It's one word, noodle, like the word noodle, B-I-B.com. And there is an easy to navigate on that website. For, you, know, you plug in what type of source you're trying to find out. How do you list this source? Or your own library uh, re reference desk. They'll, they'll also do that. And it's all done you know, online, of course, now uh, with, you know, how do I cite X, Y, or Z type of sources? You should already know how to cite uh, books or how to list them, I keep saying, in the bibliography correctly, because people will give me one of the biggest mistakes is they'll, they'll mention the title and the author of a book and maybe the year and not give me the publisher or the city. 
that's points off because that's not correct MLA format. I usually am pretty lenient on the first paper with those kind of details and tell my readers to be by the second paper, certainly. If not before you even got to the JC, you should already have done this kind of citation. But noodlebib, B-I-B, dot com, one word, or your library reference desk will help you. Okay, we've covered the requirements. Does anybody have any other quick questions before we, well, I'm going to hold this up, the cover sheet. I'm going to send that to you. I already said this. And if you see, without even having to get too much detail, because we want to get to tonight's slides. I'd like to end early tonight, but I don't want to skip anything. Maybe maybe one slide. So you see here, this is a checklist for the first item on the nine elements of composition. If you do them all thoroughly enough, you give me two or more examples. Ma'am, no, I said that the last two lectures, so you should remember that is the requirement, either on a paper or in an exam. If you don't do one of them, you get, sorry, that somebody's doing some other tasks there, it, it, then you end up maybe losing only three points, right? And then at the bottom, you get three more for having given two exams. So it's it's a pretty, it's very objective. This grading system was created by Sarah Gill when she wrote her book. And she used it at Columbia before she founded this art program at the JC. And she created the world. If you've taken any word out of this for Santa Rosa, sorry. Whoever's doing the paper tearing, could you kind of hold off on that? <laughs> or turn your mic off. If I know who it was, I might do that. I don't like muting my students, but we don't want that kind of distraction. Thank you. Okay, and then the same thing. I'm not going to get that. To you. It's, it's all right here, and I sent it to you. So you can see you get 20 points for doing a full page or more of fairly uh, clearly uh, cited sources, because where, where would you use your in-text citations and, and, and tie them into bibliography? It's almost all going to be on the meaning, because you should be able to do the formal analysis by the end of this lecture. We all have covered what we did last week, remember, in class, in the in-person classes. My other online classes, I have to wait till I can stand for an hour and use a pointer on a whiteboard, and that wasn't this week. So they're a week behind you guys. You guys have a, a head start for the paper about four elements. Remember, I had the drawing on the board, and if you didn't see it or you missed, I think everyone was there last week, you can see them next Wednesday and take a photo. So we covered the nine elements already. And so if you do a thorough job, you got 30 points right there and so forth. And then of course, I already said you get points off if you don't follow any of these instructions. This paper is an A paper and the student gave me permission to use them as an example. And you'll see if you flip through it, should be able to either electronically or, or print out a hard copy, uh, how and why they got their, um, their grade, their A, and how the sources should be cited. She only cited two sources, but that's all that was required from the bibliography. Okay, now quick questions, because we kind of want to segue and we're you know needing to get to the slides. Any questions about anything I just covered on the five requirements for your papers? Okay, let's get started with tonight's lecture. Now we're moving into a different phase of the Renaissance. Well, actually not quite. <laughs> let's, let's just say we will get to high Renaissance tonight, but when we get there, I will give you the definition, of course, of what that means. Okay, <clears throat> so this is our first must know for tonight. This is one, I always give you guys a heads up. I've been doing that for the first two weeks and I'll continue throughout the rest of the semester. When a slide is on the screen that is so important to uh, the, the you know, knowledge for the course or for your grade on that what might appear has a high possibility or probability of appearing on the exam, in this case, the midterm. When that a slide kind of a slide is on screen, I always tell you, this is one of those slides. I'm not cutting it for sure from the study list. Okay, the title, one word, David. David, and the artist, obviously a sculptor, the artist's name is Donatello, D-O-N-A-T-E-L-L-O, -L -L David, Donatello, 1428. Okay, you can round it off to 1420. Remember, that's because you have, it's an open book test, of course, you'll have the syllabus and your notes if you want them, or any books, uh, open book, open notes, uh, for, for, for both exams. Um, but anyway, if, if you want to just remember, you can round any date that's a specific year to a zero, if it isn't already. Okay, so why is this so important? This is a seminal work of art. The first thing about the meaning that you should have in your notes is that this 
was the first freestanding, I'm gonna to have to say it slowly, it's a, it's, a, it's a mouthful, but it's a very important fact about the meaning of this sculpture. This was the first life-size freestanding sculpture of a human figure since ancient times. That's the only way to write it to be accurate. Once again, it, I'll say it a second time. This was the first life-size freestanding uh, human figure created since the, the ancient times, since the fall of Rome. That's the other way to say it. That's a thousand years they had lost. Europeans we're talking about, of course, this is a year, it's from Italy. If it's not obvious, Donatello is Italian. Um, so what we have is in Europe, they lost the ability, all sculptors did, to uh, have a freestanding life-size human figure until the Renaissance revived it. Remember, I already gave you the definition of the Renaissance last week. So this is an example of them relearning something the ancient world knew, in other words, already, but it, they'd forgotten. So for a thousand years, uh, no European sculptor had done a figure like this. So th that clearly makes this a seminal, I've said that word before, right? And it's a good one to remember. A seminal work of art, it broke, uh, you know, new ground or it, it, it sort of, in other words, opened up a new trend or began, I guess a better way to say it, began a new trend, which is the use of freestanding life-size sculpture. Before, what were the sculptures? They were all leaning against a wall or a column. They weren't freestanding, if you're curious. They were all supported because he didn't know how to do this kind of figure. So what is it about the figure? The next fact about the meaning, and this is equally important, is the uh, pose. The pose is contrapposto. Again, that's on your handout, right? It's uh, about two thirds of the way down the page. So I don't need to spell these words, right? That are on the list of terms to know. Contrapposto, here we go. And this is, now this definition is a little longer than most. So I will say slowly and repeat it, but you definitely need to write it in. It's, it's, it's going to come up, if not this slide, which is good. But definitely the definition in some way will appear on the midterm. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, uh, okay, somebody needs to turn their mic down. I'm sorry, can you, <laughs> is that whoever that person is? All right, let's give you that definition. Contrapposto is a pose for sculpture, which has three features. Okay, that's why it's not a short definition, which has three features. Number one, okay, the weight is on the back leg and the front leg is loose. This leg is behind this leg. You can see that if you follow it with your eyes all the way down. Now, of course, the, like, the knee's bent and then this foot might be pretty close, but the point is the weight is on the leg that you are, it's not left or right, that's a mistake. It's not about left or right. I'll say it again, number one feature of contrapposto is that the weight is on the back leg and the front leg is loose. Clearly, David here is doing just that. He's putting his weight on, in this case, of course, on his body, it would be the right leg, which is behind the loose leg. Okay, second feature, one arm is raised and the other arm is down, usually holding something. Again, pretty straightforward. Uh, one arm is, is raised, you see, obviously there, uh, and the other is down and usually holding something. He's holding a sword, the sword he used to cut Goliath's head, of course. Well, if it's not obvious, we'll briefly mention the story. That, that should be common knowledge, I think, right? The story of David and Goliath, but I'll, I'll briefly uh, clarify that. But let's finish the definition. The third feature, of contrapposto is the spine forms a gentle S curve. The spine forms a gentle S curve. If you were to look at a spine from behind, of course, being a nude sculpture, you could easily see it. If you walked around this piece, it's in a museum in Italy, you would see that. So just again, just write that the way uh, I just stated. And that is this third feature is that the spine forms a gentle S curve. When you put all three features together, you can make a piece of sculpture, life-size human figure that, that large or bigger, even larger. We're going to see larger than life sculpture, of course, Michelangelo's David, for example, next week. When, when you can do that uh, pose, you can make these statues stand up on their own. There's no support here. There's nothing behind him. 
Um, it's been standing upright for 600 years <laughs> with no support because it's in contrapposto position. Now, one other fact about contrapposto, you don't have to write this because in our ancient art history, like I'm teaching now, R2.1, uh, an online class, you would need to know who invented contrapposto and it was the ancient Greeks. But it doesn't matter. You can just say this is a revival of an earlier technique. Well, I already stated that when I said that it had been lost, the technique of uh, freestanding life-size human figures and therefore the use of contrapposto to do that had been lost, the knowledge of it to a European artists for over a thousand years. So it's been rediscovered by this man here, Donatello. So then the next fact is who was he about the meaning? He's considered the first great Renaissance sculptor. I'll say again, the first great Renaissance sculptor. No, nobody really debates or argues that fact because he rediscovered this technique and then people copied it all over Europe. And he also was openly gay, and that wouldn't be uh, that important a fact. I mean, it's just, you know, a, a lifestyle choice, obviously. But back then, as you may know, it was not legal. In fact, it wasn't until recently in our country. So what you have here was an artist who had most historians, or you could just say many, because you don't know what percentage, but just say many historians believe this model was Donatello's lover, because the model did live with Donatello. We know that much. Um, in his studio slash house, what have you. That would be cause for them both to be arrested in, uh, in Renaissance Italy. It was in Florence, by the way, the city of Florence. But he was so important and such a great sculptor that the authorities, meaning the Catholic Church mostly and the local political leaders, the authorities uh, looked the other way. They, they ignored that quote, unquote sin, unquote, according to the, you know, authorities. It was uh, illegal and sinful. He was never harassed, let alone arrested for that, because of his importance as a sculptor. So then the last part of it is what story does it tell? I mean, maybe I should ask, is anybody here who doesn't know the story of David and Goliath? If not, I'll, I'll repeat it briefly. Anybody? Because it's pretty important to understand the meaning. This is a symbolic piece of political propaganda. There's your uh, alliteration for tonight, a piece of political propaganda. It was commissioned, the last thing on the mean now is that this sculpture of David, after he killed Goliath, it's after the battle. You see, he's standing on the severed head of Goliath. And there's his uh, stone that he used. He didn't use a sword to kill Goliath. He couldn't have reached him. <laughs> Goliath was supposedly, what, 12 feet tall or something. And he was just a, a shepherd boy, you know, a teenager. So, so the point is, it's after the battle. He's won his victory. And that's where the symbolism of this piece comes in. It has a political uh, propaganda meaning. Florence was being threatened by a much larger enemy or rival, you could say rival city. You don't have to know which, but it was Milan. It's always been a bigger city than Florence to the north. So you could just say a, um, another Italian city uh, enemy of Florence was threatening to attack that city, Florence. And so the you can guess if you put the dot, connect the dots here. Why did they commission this sculpture? And here's the last thing you should write about the meaning of this slide. <clears throat> it sends the message that if you, to their enemy, their larger, more powerful enemy, if you attack us, we'll do to you what David did to Goliath. And some think it worked. In any case, they didn't get attacked by Milan, at least not for a long, long time, not, not for decades. So this piece of sculpture was put on public display after it was commissioned by the city government, the rulers of Florence, as a political statement. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. Remember if it's on the test, uh, well, I actually haven't gotten to that part. I'll just give you a heads up to make it le a little less concerned for some of you. You are gonna have to remember everything that I've said on the meaning for each uh, set of slides, just six sentences about the meaning on each one of the three. And I wanna be three slide essays, short essays on the midterm and I'll explain how the test is given in great detail and how to study for it the week before. Okay, now let's do a formal analysis. It's a neutral color. It's black. So it can't be either warm or cool. It's balanced. Well, by definition, <laughs> of course it is. It's an intact human body with two, of course, that creates rhythm too. The two arms, two legs, two hands, two feet, um, you know, the face, the two eyes, two ears. Uh, so it's a balanced figure, left to right and top to bottom. 
Uh, it's not only one mass, though. It might look like that, but you have to break it down. I would say that Goliath's head is this first his body, then Goliath's head, and then it's a close call between his helmet. It's kind of an odd-looking helmet, right? Uh, or, or perhaps the sword is the third largest. You don't have to describe the three largest masses, right? Okay, and then we have uh, dynamic or stable. Well, both, but more stable than dynamic because he's standing upright. But when you look at his arms, especially the one that's holding the rock, and of course the top of his head, all people's, the top of every human being's head is, is curved, so that's dynamic. And then the, the severed head of Goliath, but then most of his body is, is upright except the lower leg. So it's, it's just a mixture of both stable and dynamic. Uh, there is no technique for modeling. It's just the lighting in the museum. Simulated texture is superb. It's done with carved line. Of course, this is bronze, so it was originally uh, mold, right? A carved line on the face, see there, on the muscles, hands, feet, and Goliath's helmet. So all the line is carved. Okay, um, and am I forgetting anything? Oh, for space, yeah, it's a life-size figure about uh, just under six feet tall. So it was, it was a good height for the, the model who posed for it. But there is overlapping of the hat, or some people say it's a hat, some say a helmet that he's wearing, his hand over the sword and the rock and his legs over the head of Goliath. Okay, we covered this last week, but this is another really important work that I won't be cutting from the study list. Um, so you know, make sure you study it carefully when time to review for the uh, for the midterm. Okay, so this one is Holy Trinity, Holy Trinity, T R I N I T Y. The artist's name is Masakio or Masaccio, as the Italians would pronounce it. Uh, I'll spell his last name M A S A C C I O, Masaccio. 1425. So why are we showing you this obscure painting that none of you've ever heard of? Probably no one here has heard of this artist's name unless you've taken art history classes for this period before. Because this is the first, just you have to say it this way, the first known example of a painting to use scientific perspective, period. We don't have to say in the Western world because that technique is a Western technique of uh, depicting space. I'll say it again. This is the first known painting to use scientific perspective. That, that obviously would again make it a, a seminal work of art, one that broke new ground, that started a trend, right? And people started imitating. If you want to know where he got the idea, whoops, I went the wrong way. From here, this is on the door of Florence Cathedral. Remember we covered it last week. And what you end up having with these painters passing by that cathedral on their way to other churches where they were painting things because there are hundreds of churches in Florence. I mean, it's a beautiful city. Well, yeah, it is. It's a couple hundred probably, but the dozens of them were being built at the time this was made. And Florence Cathedral, which I already, I told you already existed, the doors were crafted in the very early 1400s, took probably 15 years. And one of them, this one, we saw last week, Jacob and Sal, you have to write new notes because you should have it from last, the last class had scientific perspective. It's a first two-dimensional work of art where we think there's a vanishing point. Or we know, I'm sorry, I don't think, we know. And there's diagonal lines. You can see them in the floor tiles there. Okay, so so whoever uh, walked by this, Masaccio was one of them, would have seen the artist creating the, those panels. And, and that was a few years before this. The doors to Florence Cathedral were being created in the 1410s and 20s. So, so the point is, the bottom line to keep it short is, this uh, a work of art, this painting, the first painting we know of, well, that's why we say first known painting to use scientific perspective, was inspired by the bas relief panels on the doors of Florence Cathedral. So that doesn't tell us what's going on here. When the title gives us some clue, if if some of you know what that phrase means, but. Let's define that. The Holy Trinity is a phrase for the three holiest figures uh, in, uh, to the, you could say, to uh, the Christian religion. Or back then, there was no Protestant. <laughs> this is far back before there was a split. So you could just say to the Catholic Church. The three holiest figures, according to the Catholic Church, you know, in Christian religion were God, there he is with the big halo, Jesus, his son, and the Holy Spirit. 
supposedly that what looks like a, a white collar to some people think but that's actually a dove the holy spirit can be depicted it doesn't matter you don't need to know any of the details about how it looks but it's it's a symbol again this is symbolism now being used of god sending his spirit down to earth in the form of a ghost or a flying cross or a dove you don't have to know all that stuff but that in this case it's a dove a white dove so i'll say it again the three holiest figures that is what the word means holy trinity in the catholic church at this time were considered god his son jesus and the holy spirit some people say holy ghost okay all three are here but who are these people well this is mary with a halo his mother wearing royal blue what's well, kind of purplish blue purple and blue both are colors of royalty she's supposedly uh, going to be the queen of heaven we talked about that last week remember with the, a couple of the altarpieces so that's mary and we don't know which of the disciples this is it's not clearly identified but one of the disciples these two people don't even belong in the painting but they are the rich couple who paid for it they're the donors that's a short way of saying it husband and wife they were a wealthy couple who paid the artist to and, and donated this painting to this church it's not inside Florence Cathedral, by the way. It doesn't matter where it is. You don't need to know. A different church. So they paid for it. So they got their portraits. They got their schnozzes <laughs> at the bottom of this painting. And forever, people will talk about them, though. I'm sure historians know who they were, but we don't need to know their names. So only ones you need to identify are Mary, if this is on the midterm, right, with the bluish purple robe, royal robes on. Jesus, obviously, the guy on the cross. And God up above supposedly looking down from heaven sending his uh, holy spirit down to earth probably to you know guide jesus's go uh, spirit back up to heaven okay and the last thing about it is it's meant to give the illusion of a real uh chapel a recessed chapel on the wall many churches do have such things of course uh and this church might have but this is all two dimensions that's why the scientific perspective use here was so well revolutionary so advanced no other artist had figured out in a two-dimensional work of art, at least not in a painting, I'm sorry, I meant to say in a painting, how, how to create the illusion of real space. And that gives this artist, Masaccio, uh, a distinction as the first artist uh, to use, that we know of, uh, uh, to use the scientific perspective. So let's do the formal analysis here. These are the diagonal lines. You see how if you drew them all and kept going, they would go all the way down let's see there we go to meet at a point below jesus's feet on the cross that's where they'd meet of course out over behind the wall in on the horizon um so their diagonal lines are visible in this on the ceiling only but if you did the same thing from below they'd meet at the same point common vanishing point from the edges of the stairs they're sharper in other words the lines are sharper on the bottom but they all meet at a vanishing point somewhere below jesus's feet on the cross so there is a vanishing point obviously that means it's got for space scientific perspective obviously overlapping all two-dimensional works of art have that jesus overlaps god both of them overlap the background of the chapel and and then these two, four figures overlap the uh, space the, the structure that they're supposed to be in similar texture is oh i didn't finish with the yeah there is a i would say for sure yes on the ceiling yeah the ceiling there's foreshortening i don't see diminishing size and obviously there's no atmospheric perspective because we're not looking at a landscape outside you know so it's just overlapping foreshortening and scientific perspective all right then we have the the um similar texture it's superb on the you see that on jesus's muscles on his hair uh, and skin and of course this is supposed to be marble now remember this is over six or just about 600 years old it's been exposed to the air for six centuries so of course it's faded a little bit uh, and probably some moisture damage or something like that from tourists breath that's an actual thing i mean i had to make up that phrase some works of art you can't get close to in your certain paintings especially like the last supper we're going to see that tonight uh right at the end uh, because of uh, the breath of th millions of tourists every year was beginning to make it crack and peel and <laughs> deteriorate. So it's called tourist breath phenomena. <laughs> so you can't get too close to some of these paintings. I, I don't know about this one. I've never been to this church. All I know is that the original colors, of course, would have been cool on the marble uh, columns and uh, 
pillars, they call you get to say columns, and steps, and, and a mixture of warm and cool on the ceiling, and warm up above on the arch. And then, of course, you, you guys by now, you can pick out warm and cool colors. Cool on her robes, cool on hers, warm on his, warm on his, warm on the school uh, skin, sorry, but skin tone, cool on the loincloth. And then God could make up his mind, one of my students said, between a cool green half robe and the other half is a warm pinkish color. So it's a completely almost balanced between alternating areas of warm and cool colors. And the cement texture already mentioned is excellent. The modeling is also very realistic. You can count on that with most Renaissance uh, paintings that they're gonna have sharp and realistic simulated texture and modeling. You see that on Jesus's muscles and to some degree on the ceiling where there's some shadow here and on the robes of everybody. It's almost entirely stable. Look closely, the only thing dynamic really is the archway. Well, the ceiling behind it, but that's really one section. Uh, Jesus' body's at a right angle, God standing pretty straight. I mean, of course the tops of their heads are curved in their halos. But the figures are upright uh, and the walls around them, it, it's mostly stable. The largest mass is the ceiling, I would say, probably. And then it's a close call, but probably Jesus, because you can see his whole body. And then um, I, it's hard to say you, you see, if you think God shows more of his, uh, you know, presence than Mary, maybe, but he's behind Jesus. So that would be up to you. I, I give you guys flexibility on things like which are the largest masses, unless it's very obvious in this case. Clearly, the ceiling of this scene is a larger mass than any of the human figures. All the lines are thin outline. It's completely balanced, totally. You can see that with these two figures here, two figures there, God and Jesus in the middle, the ceiling and the stairs roughly you know, balancing each other out. And so wherever you draw the line, top to bottom or left to right, it is balanced both ways. Uh, and then let's see, am I forgetting anything? Rhythm, of course, the, the repeated uh, decorative tiles on the, on the roof, the columns and the human bodies, arms, hands, legs are all repeated shapes. Okay, now this one is a uh, very important one. Again, I know you're gonna say, I'm gonna say that all night, but actually we'll get to a couple that aren't gonna be, you know, in the category of absolutely not being removed from the study list. But so far the first three are. So this one is the birth of Venus, Botticelli. B-O-T-T-I-C-E-L-L-I. -L -L -I. So it's double T, double L. B-O-T-T-I-C-E-L-L-I. Birth of Venus. Uh, I'm sure you all can spell those words, right? The day Sorry, can you repeat, sir? Pardon? Can you repeat? Which one? What do you want me to repeat? The title or the artist's name? Name. The name, sure, of course. Uh, you know, of course, capital B, right? O T T I C E L L I. Botticelli. You know, with Italian, if you say it slowly, much like with Spanish, pronounce it correctly it's pretty phonetic except that italians like to use double consonants like to, in this name the two t's and two l's so that's why you can use your i don't know if that was one of one of the newer students that joined after the first night but just everyone remember now you have your syllabus to look at during the test so you shouldn't have a problem with the spelling of any of these slides as long as you identify them correctly the ones there will only be eight slides on the uh, midterm and eight others on the final. Remember, the final is not cumulative. Once you finish the midterm, you can forget all that information. And only what's after the midterm will be subject to being on the final. All right, why is this a seminal work of art? Oh, it absolutely is. Because it is the first famous, you got to say it that way, because it could be something we haven't seen yet, but that we know of. So I'll say it again slowly and repeat it. <clears throat> this was the first famous painting to depict a life-size nude female figure from ancient mythology in over a thousand years. That phrase is going to come up a lot because it's a given. The Renaissance was a revival of ancient classical learning. I gave you guys that definition. You're definitely going to see that come up, that, that term or, or the, the, the meaning of it on the midterm pretty important obviously the first half of this semester so so what we have is <clears throat> a, a work of art that harks back to the ancient classical images of venus now who was venus venus was the ancient greek and roman both cultures believed in her ancient greek and roman goddess of love 
and female beauty. She had other powers too, but those are the two main powers. Venus, that planet in the solar system are, is named after her, right? Venus. Okay, so again, I'll repeat that though. The most important fact about the meaning is that this is the first famous painting to depict a life-size nude female figure from ancient mythology since uh, in over, just say over a thousand years. You could say since ancient times. That's the other way to say it. Ancient times mean since the fall of Rome, of course, that's when the ancient world ended, right? So what we have here is a scandal, a shocking display to people of anywhere in Europe, frankly, but Italy or otherwise, it was painted in Florence. It's in the, anybody here been to Florence? I thought one or two people said they had. Anybody in class tonight been to Florence? Nobody wants to, okay. I'd swear one or two of your mini bios mentioned that. I thought one, one person in the class, uh, this, this uh, section had, had been there during the pan, first pandemic shutdown. Uh, I know people who were difficult times, but they, they, everyone I know who was there as an overseas study overseas program uh, got home safely. Okay, so it's in Florence. And in Florence, artists were taking risks including Donatello being openly gay. I already said that. This artist was insulting the morality of the conservative Catholic figures, the Catholic church officials. And they wanted an explanation. How dare you paint a nude female figure? That itself was a, a scandal. It created controversy. But the other reason it was scandalous was she was a mythological figure. She wasn't a Christian religious figure like every other Renaissance painter was doing. I'll repeat that. There's two ways in which this was considered controversial and even blasphemous. We'll just say scandalous. That's good enough. Uh, to, to the authorities, you know, which would be the Inquisition. <laughs> they use torture, you know, so you don't want to get on their bad side. So uh, he was in trouble for both having painted a life-size female nude and also because she was a figure from ancient mythology. So how did he get away with it? That's my own phrasing. How, how did he survive the, the controversy? And this painting then was accepted enough to be posted in public in their main museum in Florence. It's still there. It's been there on the same wall for almost 550 years. It's called the Uffizi Gallery. It's one of the world's great museums. Anyway, here's how he got away with it. Your next definition will explain that. So look down your list. Neoplatonic art. Again, I don't can spell the words that are on the list of terms. They're right there in front of you. So here's that definition. It's second from the bottom of the first page of the list of terms for this class. Neoplatonic, one word, art, second word. That's a uh, style of Renaissance art. Mostly it's in painting. So you could even just say that style of Renaissance painting in which the main figures have a dual identity, comma, okay, in which the main figures have a dual identity, comma, one as an ancient mythological figure, comma, and the other as a Christian figure, a Christian religious figure, I should say. I'll say it again, in which the main objects, this style, uh, main, main figures, I'm saying the main figures have a dual identity, I would say colon, maybe a semicolon. One as an ancient mythological figure, and the second as a Christian religious figure. Well, how does that work? We know that she's Venus, okay? So the ancient mythological meaning is, is obvious. By the way, if you don't know the story, you don't have to, to, to if this is on the exam, but it's helped, it's part of the meaning. So I'll tell you, is, uh, Venus was born from a, a, a sea of Zeus's sperm. I'm not making that up. <laughs> the Greek mythologies were a little strange, right? By modern standards. Uh, Zeus was the head god, you know, the most powerful god. And supposedly he helped create this beautiful female goddess who became the goddess of, of uh, female beauty and love named Venus. Uh, from a sea of his sperm, which is what we're looking at there. Now, of course, that right there would have been enough of a controversy to upset the Catholic Church officials at that time. But then we also have the goddess of spring, symbolized here with the dress full of flowers, and, and, and the cape even has flowers. So she's another ancient uh, mythological figure. The goddess of spring actually has a name, Primavera, but you can just say goddess of spring. And then these are two wind gods, not supposed to be angels, right? Wind gods. 
coming down from Mount Olympus, where the gods, the Greek gods, supposedly lived, to blow her ashore in a seashell. That's the story it's telling. Well, how does that have anything to do with Christian religious themes? And here's what the artist, Botticelli, said. And it's amazing, but they accepted it. He said, oh, well, they, these all have dual meaning. First of all, Venus doubles as Mary, mother of Jesus. Okay, you bought that one? All right, then <laughs> the two wind gods are actually also symbolic of angels sent down by God from heaven to bless Mary, who's going to give birth to Jesus, right? And this is my favorite double uh, identity. This one, the, the goddess of spring, is St. John the Baptist in drag. <laughs> That's my own phrase, the last part. But literally, they're saying that that is supposed to symbolize St. John the Baptist, who was the one that uh, converted Jesus. Uh, according to the Bible, to become the first Christian minister. So what we have are three images that are dual identities. The obvious ones are what you see when you first look at it, the ancient Greek mythology symbolism or meaning. And then I just gave you the other three. So that, that's pretty much the whole meaning. And yes, it worked. He was able to get the painting uh, it not only accepted, uh, but displayed in public and continue painting others scenes like this, where he did these dual identities in that style, that, that vein. He didn't invent the Neoplatonic, I think he did, uh, uh, School of Art, but he was the most famous artist to use that concept. So he more than just, you know, got away with it. He, he for, formed a whole new career from this concept of, I'm going to use these mythological figures and I'm going to tell the authorities that they also are religious uh, figures from the Bible. <laughs> it worked. Okay, so that's pretty much the whole meaning. So well, there's one other thing. Anybody notice something odd about the landscape here? You don't have to write this. You have plenty on the meaning, but I think it's a relevant part of the meaning. These oh, trees look like they're made out of hollow plastic tubes. The leaves look like they're completely fake. And the land itself doesn't look real at all. He never did, or rarely, don't say never, he, he rarely um, painted realistic landscapes. He wasn't into that like Da Vinci and Michelangelo were. He didn't care about the landscape. He wants you to focus on the figures in the foreground, including the sea of sperm and the giant seashell. He doesn't want you to pay attention to the background. So he didn't, it's part of his style. He, he would, he would uh, you could just say, use minimal techniques to depict landscape. And last but not least in the meaning, he used these pastel colors on the uh, main figures, especially on their skin tones, but you can even see it on the seashell to some degree. His colors were known to be somewhat pastel compared to the bright, rich colors of say Van Eyck, like we saw last week or you'll see later with Michelangelo and da Vinci, they didn't use pastel colors. They used bright, deep, rich, vivid colors. He, he didn't, he used softer. You could say softer or more pastel tones. Okay, that's plenty on meeting. The formal analysis, um, it is very carefully repeat something? Sorry, go ahead, question. Go um, ahead. Could you please repeat what the wind god and spring goddess represent, like what they double as? Yeah, sure, sure. The wind gods uh, double as angels from heaven, like Christian angels. Uh, whereas the Greeks didn't, of course, have any Christian beliefs. So supposedly they're just coming down from heaven to, uh, you know, oversee or bless, I guess is the word, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is supposedly, right, who Venus was. And the primavera, well, just say this goddess of spring, <laughs> the other identity is John the Baptist, supposedly, you know, the one that was the first Christian. Right, who converted Jesus to become the first Christian minister. So the woman with the cape who's about to cover the nudity of Venus is supposed to be a very unusual double identity. Uh, that's why I said John the Baptist in drag. I was being silly. But uh, the point is that that surprises me that he didn't get uh, pushback on that, at least. But they accepted his explanation. And he was, like I said, successful. After this, uh, he wasn't being challenged anymore. He was able to paint this kind of scene for many more uh, years, his rest of his career. Um, <clears throat> anyway, it's because, you know, they, they knew he was such a great, talented painter. and They, they kind of wanted to make some explanation that they could excuse the nudity and the mythology part that they were upset about. All right, let's just finish up the formal analysis. Did we even start in? I can't. It's, I, I was about to say, yes, we just started. Sorry, she's dead center in the middle. These two figures are almost the same exact space. If you did the math, 
you know, from wing tip to foot tip. I mean, there it's roughly balanced left to right. Uh, some people think it's it's unbalanced toward the top though because of the, the we'll say sea or water down here. But I see that as a mass, a solid. I mean, I think it's balanced both ways, roughly balanced. And then we have the largest mass. Well, I think it's John the Baptist slash <laughs> the goddess of spring, pretty much because it's a single figure and, and that figure they, he, or she, however you want to read that, uh, is wider and a little taller than the other three figures. So I would say the second largest mass is the two uh, wind gods slash angels because they seem to be together. So they pretty much make a single mass. And then Venus would be the third largest mass. The Syriac texture, as always, is superb on the seashell, uh, except on the landscape it's not, but on the seashell, on the hair, on the skin, on the clothing. It's all very realistic, as is the modeling, sharp, realistic modeling. All the lines everywhere, you see, ex again, except, well, actually, even on the landscape, you see strong modeling. All the lines are thin, thin outline on all the objects. The colors are uh, cool on the water slash sperm, on the sky, of course, and on the trees, and uh, at least on the robes of the two angels and uh, John the Baptist here, but warm on all the skin tones and uh, cool again on the seashell. Oh yeah, and warm on the hair of all, all four figures. Uh, it is totally dynamic. I think the only slightly, well, the trees, yeah, the tree trunks behind the figures. Well, she is kind of standing at an angle. So you could see her upper body, but not her head then. Her head and her neck are dynamic. So it's mostly dynamic with uh, some stable parts on Venus's body and the tree trunks. Okay, let's see. Are we missing anything else? Uh, rhythm. The rhythm is uh, very, oh yeah, in space, two more. And I'll take any questions. The rhythm is repeated. Uh, shapes is everywhere you see the rhythm on the sea slash sperm or sea of sperm the seashell i mean everywhere obviously our human bodies have rhythm we've already covered that two arms two hands right two legs the rhythm is very powerful and for space there is no atmospheric perspective that's not a blue hazy look that's just the water itself the horizon doesn't have that hazy thing so does not have atmospheric perspective, but it does have scientific perspective. Every Renaissance painter who is at all competent by this time, you just can count on it, was using scientific perspective. Now, some of them got more complex, and we had the discussion with one of you guys' fellow students last week in class, remember that some painters, many of them began using multi-point perspective, but that's getting more detailed than we have necessary to, 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 to go into, unless you know that's true and you're writing a paper about a work with multiple point perspective, but this appears to have a single point vanishing, a single vanishing point. And it has overlapping. Every work of art uses overlapping. If there's a, more than one object in any, any uh, two-dimensional work of art, it's going to have overlapping, obviously. And then we have, I would say, diminishing size on the landscape and maybe not so much on the trees, but on the water and the landscape. But I don't see foreshortening here. I don't see that anywhere. Okay, a question. Somebody had a question. She's in a... Um... Contraposto pose? Yeah, right? excellent. Good point. Sorry, I almost forgot that. I would have probably. Yeah, she is. Yeah, yeah. Her weight is on this leg. And if you could look carefully, this one's only slightly forward from the other, but you're right, she is. And she has a slight S curve. And yes, uh, one arm is down. It's holding her hair over her privates, right? Or whatever you want to word that. Excellent point. Yes, she's in contrapposto. But by this time, that was nothing new, of course. But uh, but it's very much a part of this composition. Okay, let's see how we're doing on uh, time. Um, I I wasn't going to take a break, but my foot's starting to throb. So, and I think everyone could use like just a brief, you know, quick trip to the kitchen or wherever it is you are. Uh, so we could take a shorter break, maybe fifteen minutes instead of twenty, and still end early. Is that all right? How about we do one more must know and take a 15 minute break? Is that okay with everybody? And still end early. Like, Sounds good to me. We should be able to end at least nine, uh, 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes early. But we have a lot to say about the last two slides. So why am I showing you this? It's not a must know. I think some of you, I'm amazed no one has made a documentary or a dramatic film of this incident. It's an amazing fact. The largest art theft in the history of the human race that's what this illustrates. It's another now missing for 30 years 
painting by Botticello that was in the Boston Gardner Museum, it's called. There's some great museums all over Boston. Uh, but the one that most people um, know little, if anything, if they don't live in the Boston area, maybe never heard of, is the Gardner Museum, which had this incredible collection of masters from the Renaissance all the way through Rembrandt, from you know uh, Botticelli and um, all of the you know, high Renaissance artists all the way through Van Dyck and all these artists we're going to cover. Let's just say it had a high, high quality uh, collection that a millionaire had left to the museum when she uh, passed away, though actually the widow of a millionaire named Gardner. She gave the museum to the city of Boston. Guess what? 1990 was that 30, 32 years ago. They were robbed. It was an inside job. I'm going to cut it to break because we, we want to, you know, do one more must know and still take a break right at about eight. So what does that mean? That means that someone knew which were the 18 most valuable paintings in the museum. How could they know that if they didn't have inside information? They stole the 18 most highly insured paintings in a museum with hundreds. There were Rembrandts they stole, Van Dyck's, uh, uh, Rubens. <laughs> I mean, you recognize some of these names. And yes, a couple, including this one by Botticelli, some of the oldest paintings. They knew what they were going after. The guards were found tied up and gagged, you know, with tape over their mouths in a broom closet the next morning by the opening security team. But some people think they might have been in on it. Nobody knows. No one has ever been arrested. These paintings keep turning up and then they don't. It's, it's amazing that no one has yet found a single one of those 18 paintings from that theft of the Gardner Museum. The FBI, you know, it's a federal crime, right, has been searching and, and, and trying to, you know, investigate. It's, it's still an open case. It's not a cold case. Because about every year or two, someone calls it anonymously, usually the FBI or emails them with a tip and says, I'll have someone or themselves show up at a warehouse after midnight at such and such an address somewhere in the Boston area, wherever New York, and the FBI shows up and it's a forgery. So they arrest the person on the spot. It's happened at, oh, easily a half dozen times. And no one knows the answer. Where are these paintings? I think I know. They're in some wealthy person's wine cellar. It's called designer theft. That's an actual phrase. Look it up in the art world. Someone commissioned that theft and they paid the thieves a lot. Could have been the security guards and someone working with them or someone in the museum. But I don't think they, they right now, obviously we would, if it had been an obvious thing. So somehow someone figured out how to get the best and most valuable works of art out of one of the best small museums in the United States and keep them out of public sight for over 30 years. Okay, this is the next must know and it'll take us up to our break. This is uh, Old Man and His Grand, I think it should be Grandson, but I don't wanna confuse you, so I'll use Stockstead's title. It's clearly a boy, we know who these people were. We don't have to guess the, the man and, and the child but I'll use her title, Old Man and His Grandchild. Okay, Girland Dow is the artist. That's G-H-I-R-L-A-N-D-A-I-O. Again, these are on your syllabus. You should be looking at them, so I don't want to have to spell everything twice. So Girland Dow is how you pronounce it. Uh, and the date is 1480. So why is this an important work? I'm not saying it's so important it might or might not be cut from the study list, but for now, any slide you see on the syllabus, uh, you can assume has a chance of being on the uh, midterm. <clears throat> All right. Well, this is one of the first secular works of art. Let's see, did I give you that definition? Sometimes I don't put it on. I think it might be, hmm. let's see. No, it's not. Okay, you get a break on this. That's one of my other classes. Uh, this is a secular work of art, and it's one of the first famous secular, and I'll tell you what that means. Of course, it's part of the notes for this slide. Secular means having to do with everyday life or non-religious themes. I'll say it again. Secular is a term in, when it's applied to art that means having to do, you know, work of art, having to do, with everyday life or non-religious themes. There's nothing religious about this painting. If it's not obvious, when you hear now what's going on, uh, it'll be clear why we say this is very clearly secular. But Girland Dow is more important than just the first painter, or what, just say one, we can't say the first, but one of the first painters 
to use secular themes, because remember the definition of the Renaissance itself was, right, a revival of ancient classical art uh, with an emphasis on Christian religious themes. I gave you that definition last week. You definitely want to know that one for the midterm. So where's the religious themes? They aren't. So he was bucking the trend, if you want to call it that way. He was, he was doing something different. Uh, he, he did plenty of religious paintings. You couldn't have made a living as a painter without doing a lot of paintings for the Catholic Church. They were the main uh, source of commissions back then. Well, them and the wealthy families, of course. So in order to, you know, have a successful career, he, he did, you know, many, many religious paintings. But he also is one of the first famous artists, we'll say it that way, to paint uh, various secular scenes. So, so what is this scene? By the way, it's my own slide taken in the Louvre. It's right around the corner from Mona Lisa, which we are going to see tonight. So what, what's going on here? Well, this boy, and yes, it is a boy, about a four-year-old, maybe five, probably closer to four, it looks like, just say a young boy, is visiting his grandfather in the country. And if this doesn't look familiar, wait till you see uh, the slide I just mentioned, the most famous painting in the history of the world, right? The one that's coming up after the break by... Da Vinci. Guess what? This is a really important fact about this slide. This guy, Gerland Dow, was the teacher of both Michelangelo and Da Vinci. You can't get more important than that. We might not have had either of those two artists have a painting in, uh, sorry, I mean, a career in painting if they hadn't studied under a master who really understood how to paint human figures and different scenes and create landscapes interesting landscapes. That's why Da Vinci and Michelangelo, I said a few slides back, uh, did not ignore landscapes in there. Well, sometimes they did, but usually they depicted a detailed landscape. And they learned it from this guy. He was their teacher. That's pretty amazing. One guy to have that much of a connection to the high Renaissance. We haven't gotten to the high Renaissance. That'll be right after the break. Okay, so what's going on is pretty simple, but let's see if anybody wants to comment on. There's some kind of connection between, of course, there usually is in any family where there's a you know, close emotional bond between a grandchild, in this case, we'll say a grandson and his grandfather. But let's take a close look. I have a close up that I took when I got uh, at the museum. Look at their faces. Look at their eyes, the expressions on their mouths, the body language of the little boy with his hand on his grandfather's chest, and then look at his grandfather's nose, and then put all that together and see if you can think of a phrase, there's no right or wrong here, but most historians have pretty definitely concluded what the uh, state of mind or emotional state of the little boy is. What's he feeling about his grandfather at that moment that the artist is trying to portray? What human emotion? Anybody? There's no right or wrong. So what does it look like to any of you? I don't think it just looks like they're mirroring each other. It's like. Well, yeah, but what would be the emotion? Uh, yeah, you're right about that. That's true. They're kind of meant to balance each other and the two different ends of the generation, family yeah. generation. But, but the feeling that might be between them, how would you describe it? Put it that way. It's like admiration. Close, pretty close. I mean, you could almost say it that way, but there is even a stronger, or more, I mean, not stronger, more specific term, I think. It's what we hope people feel in a, let's say, healthy, functional, not dysfunctional family when they get together after, obviously they don't live together. It's not obvious. He's visiting. I did say that. His, his grandfather. See, we know who these people are. Okay. It, we're getting close to when we should take a break. I'll just give it to you. The, the <laughs> phrase I think you should use is unconditional love. That little boy doesn't care his grandfather's nose is disease. His grandfather had cancer of the nose. His grandfather died, probably from that. We don't know exactly because medicine wasn't very advanced in the Renaissance. Whoops, went the wrong way. But there's no question the father's not totally healthy. The grandfather, I mean. But the little boy doesn't care. All he cares about is he's seeing his grandpa and he loves him. So it's unconditional love is the secular meaning of this painting. It has nothing to do with religious, you know, faith or anything, belief. It's between two human beings on this earth, a close connection with a little boy not having any judgment about how his grandfather's nose looks. It, that doesn't matter to him. He's just happy to see him. 
And maybe he understands it might be the last time he sees him. Who knows? We don't know the details. We just know this guy, who he was, and uh, that he died not too long after this painting was completed. So it was commissioned probably by the grandfather, maybe by the boy's father. It's pretty touching. I can tell you this, right after my father passed away, it was at the beginning of, of a winter semester, I had trouble showing up for class. And I showed this painting and I had to stop in the middle of that lecture and take a moment. And understood people in the you know, classroom that night who had lost a family member understood. <laughs> it's a brilliant painting. It's one of my favorites of all time. And it's one of the most valuable paintings at the Louvre. And yet people go right by it to see the Mona Lisa because that's in the next room right around the corner and don't even know what this is. So now you guys do. This man, you could study him for extra credit or, or watch documentary. I'm sure there are some about him. Maybe they're all in Italian translated with uh, you know subtitles, but there must be at least. Or, or of course, even write a paper about it. He did a lot of paintings. Uh, so oh, it's uh, who drew that picture? Say again, please go who ahead. Who drew that picture? Girland Dow. Do, do, do you have your syllabus in front of you? Is that Jonathan? Because it's on the syllabus. I, I'll spell it one more time, but we kind of want to wrap this up and take a break. The artist's name, Girland Dow, right? Is G H I R L A N D A I O. You pronounce it Girland Dow. Okay, but you have your syllabus, I hope, because everyone's supposed to have them every time you, you log on. I mean, sorry, <laughs> when we see each other in person next week you'll have it with you right in class so that way you don't have to uh you know worry about the spelling uh, i always do spell at least once all of the uh you know uh, uncommon like last names of the artists but but I, you know usually I, I can't do it two or three times but i'm happy to do that for tonight because we're on a zoom function here okay so you got Girlandau was his name is how you say it in italian okay let's wrap up with a formal analysis and take our break uh it is very cleverly balanced. I forget who it was that pointed out in class last week. It was a very good observation. The golden triangles, at least what I've heard it called, there's different, you know, dividing paintings into thirds. Well, here is what you have. You have the window section, the view outside the window, then the grandfather's body, his head and the upper section, you could say, and then you have the little boy, or you, you know, there's different ways you could divide this up. It is balanced very carefully, but not obviously. So you could just say rough balance if you want. Uh, but some people think because where my cursor is, that wall is empty, but that's not empty. That's solid mass. It's, you know, a wall made out of probably stone or, you know, in any case, I see mass there above and below, uh, you know, top to bottom. Uh, there is sky out the window. So some people come, but, you know, you, I leave that to you, but I see it as roughly balanced in a diagonal way here and here and then from the grandfather's shoulder and chest to the window scene outside the window. It's roughly balanced, both directions. And then we have the largest mass, that's easy, the grandfather, then the little boy, and then you decide, is it the landscape outside? If you don't count sky as having mass, which actually it does, if you count that as empty, then you might say the wall behind them is the third largest. All the lines in almost every Renaissance painting, except Michelangelo and a couple of others who imitate him, and here, definitely, there are no bold outlines. It's all thin outlines. Uh, the similar texture, again, this is say, I'm not going to always repeat all nine elements because you should be able to see by now, I hope, right, that there's strong similar texture on the hair, the clothing, the skin, including his cancerous nose, and outside on the landscape. Okay, and then we have the rhythm of their uh, you know, faces, uh, eyes, nose, mouth, and of course, the folds of the grandfather's robes fingers in the boy's hand. The modeling is strong and realistic everywhere on their, you know, their skin, the clothing. And then we have on the landscape for space, we have overlapping. And here's there's foreshortening, I would say, on the windowsill and the grandfather's shoulders. But out the window, we definitely have atmospheric perspective and scientific perspective, no question. He would have taught this artist, both Michelangelo and da Vinci, how to depict landscapes with realistic, uh, uh, you know, space because of that technique he had mastered, he taught Michelangelo and da Vinci how to use scientific and atmospheric perspective. And then the colors are warm on the red clothing or orange, I guess it is, and the skin tones and cool on the wall and the grandfather's hair and the mountain in the distance. Um, and it is mostly stable. He's upright. The windowsill is you know, straight, right? Uh, the little boy, mostly, mostly upright, except for his arm. 
okay, we're right about eight, let's make it, okay, call it 14 minutes. How about 8.15? And then we should be able to finish about 9.15 because we do have two of the most important paintings and one of the most bizarre ones in the history of Renaissance art to cover uh, after the break. But we should be, end, be able to end about uh, 9.15. Okay, I'll see you all then at uh, 8.15, okay? I'm taking a pause here, all right. Okay, let's resume where we left off. Um, and we've got two of the most important paintings in the history of art uh, to cover, and that's The Last Supper and the Mona Lisa. But first, we will look at this mysterious painting. Uh, welcome back, everybody. It's 8.15. So here we are. There, there's three more must knows. We're still going to be able to end a little bit early, but I don't want to rush because these are, um, uh, well, the last two especially really uh, interesting. Uh, I'm going to cut one of the slides I decided during the break, which is if you go back up on your syllabus and look at the third slide, the Church of Sant'Andrea by Alberti. Uh, we've got other Renaissance churches we're going to you know, already covered last week, and we'll cover one or two more later. So just do that. Week three, obviously, this week's list. Go down to the third slide. We, you may have noticed we skipped over it. Just cross it off. Church of Sant'Andrea by Alberti, we won't cover. Obviously, that isn't going to be on the midterm. Now, this one isn't. The next one is Giorgione or Gigorini is my aunt in Indiana. If you're from the Midwest, you know what I'm talking about, especially Indiana. I can diss Indiana because it's my, my whole mother's half of my family is from there. Uh, wonderful people. I love my relatives there in case any of them ever watch my YouTube channel. But pronouncing foreign names, especially last foreign names, is not their strong suit. <laughs> so uh, my, I had an aunt who knew everything there was about each of the works of art she liked and had prints and books of them but she couldn't pronounce her name. So she said Gigorgini or something like that. Giorgini is how you pronounce it. I'll spell it slowly, of course. There's an artist whose name is not well known, but this painting is pretty famous. G-I-O-R-G-I-O-N-E. Giorgini is how I pronounce it. Some have said Giorgione. It's Italian, you pronounce it however you want. Just remember the spelling you have in front of you when the test is being given, it'll be right there on the syllabus. <coughs> the title, everyone can spell this, The Tempest, The Tempest. And the date, we don't know the exact year. Circa, little c, means about 1510. It's about that year, right around then. So this painting is a mystery. There's no absolute consensus, you could say, or agreed uh, interpretation about the meaning of it. There are several theories, and I'll just give you two or three of the leading ones. We'll start with the fact that what's obvious is there's an Italian city. I mean, if it's not obvious with his name, he's Italian, right? And this was a scene somewhere in Italy. It's probably an imaginary Italian city in the distance with a storm, or you could say storm clouds gathering on the horizon. And then we have a nude woman suckling a baby, we assume it's her baby, sitting by herself on a, a, a mound above a footpath. And then what looks almost like a soldier with a spear. He's not wearing armor, but soldiers often didn't wear armor when they were just, you know, traveling. Uh, we don't know, it might not be a soldier. Then again, it could be her husband. Then why is he standing that far away <laughs> and looking at her in a strange, with an strange expression? Nobody knows. So the theories are that this could be an allegory for the sinfulness of cities and or the, the you know, popular culture of Italy in this century, which there's plenty of proof that all, not just Italy, but almost all the European kingdoms, and they were kingdoms, not countries back then, had a pretty corrupt ruling classes, right? Machiavelli and uh, the Borgias and the Medicis, they all assassination, murder, poisoning, you know, sounds like Putin, right? <laughs> I mean, it was a given. That's how you got into power and tried to maintain it or took it, tried to take it away from someone. So the corruption was very rampant throughout Italian upper class, Italian society. So that could be what this is. God's judgment, see here, symbolized by the storm clouds is about to come down on the heads of these uh, 
corrupt people in the city. And these two figures have tried to leave to get away from the corrupt city. That's one theory. Uh, the broken columns here somewhat track with that idea. But that that's just a theory. No one knows because the artist never explained this. He was a mystery painter too. He painted mysterious scenes, only a few of which are obvious, like some are, are scenes in the Bible. And those we know the meaning of because he was, uh, you know, just just illustrating a, a chapter in the Bible. But that's not what's going on here. This the whole thing is imaginary. So we don't know who this guy is. He could be her husband. He could be a passerby. He could even be a soldier. Maybe he's, you know, being protective, guarding her while she's feeding her infant. But who is she? It could be Mary and Joseph. That would be a scene from the Bible on their way out of Egypt when God punished, right? Uh, <clears throat> Or is it the way to Egypt, wasn't it? Yeah, the way to Egypt, sorry. Uh, just the, uh, in other words, it could be a scene from the Bible where Mary, mother of Jesus, that would be an unusual way to depict her. It definitely wouldn't be acceptable to the Catholic Church to show her nude. Uh, and then her husband, Joseph. But then he's, he's supposed to be 25 years older than her. That guy doesn't look that much older than her. Nobody knows. The point is, this is a mystery painting and it's fascinating and as many theories have come up on this painting as, as there are art critics and art historians. Uh, personally, I think it's more just an allegory about the sinfulness and evil and corruption in the big city and that these two characters are, are just happen to be leaving the city and, and uh, crossing paths at the same time. Nobody knows. Okay, the uh, formal analysis, it's got atmospheric perspective in this one. See the even bluish hazy look on these towers back here and even sort of in the clouds and on the river to some degree. So, so it's got atmospheric perspective, no question scientific perspective. Just about every Renaissance landscape had that. Overlapping, foreshortening, and diminishing size. You can see all those elements here, if you recall the, the discussion we had in class last week about all those techniques. Obviously, the sizes of the towers diminish and everything's got overlapping. And uh, foreshortening is visible on the ground and so forth. So then we have thin outline on all the objects. The largest mass, well, ugh, you decide. I mean, it could be anything. It could be this tree if you just take each object separately, or it could be the sky if that's one whole solid mass, or it could be this clump of dirt that she's uh, the new female figure is sitting on. Um, you know, it's 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 up to you to decide that. It's not really obvious. It is roughly balanced left to right. And I would say the clouds have mass. So to me, is there somebody with a, a question? No, is that a chat? Well, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you guys separate chats, but if you have a question that's relevant for everyone to know or for me to uh, comment on, then feel free to do verbally or raise your hand kind of a uh, technique from the Zoom functions. Anybody have a question that you want to ask about what we've said so far on this painting or this slide? Well, let's, let's finish up with the formal analysis and then we'll take our time and not rush through because I have multiple views of the last two paintings and you can guess they have both very high probability of not necessarily both, but one or the other of the two Da Vinci paintings of, of possibly being on the midterm. But let's finish up with this one without rushing. Okay, I see there's mass in the sky. I mean, the clouds have mass. So I think it's balanced any way you look at it. Left to right, top to bottom, two human figures, two sets of trees, a river in the middle, sky and earth, roughly the same area. It, it's meant to be balanced, visually balanced. You can say roughly balanced both ways. And then we have the um, rhythm, of course, of the trees, the city walls, the, uh, you know, parts of the earth, you know, the mounds of, you know, uh, dirt <laughs> and the human bodies, of course, arms, hands, legs, feet, heads, uh, plenty of rhythm. Is it stable or dynamic? Mostly dynamic, but there's a lot of stable things. The two broken columns. This uh, looks like part of an aqueduct that, you know, a ruins of an aqueduct, a Roman aqueduct, which are all over Italy, by the way. Uh, the Roman ruins are everywhere in Italy. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, uh, the walls of the city. Um, there's quite a bit of, of a stable detail here and that bridge really. He's standing upright, but she's not uh, stable. She's dynamic as are, you know, the clouds, the trees, the dirt, uh, you know, a little hillock, I guess you could call it a little clump of, of dirt at the bottom are not uh, stable. So it's a mixture. Colors are warm on the earth, of course, it's always cool on the water and the sky. 
warm on the leaves and the trees, at least the part we can see color in. And the human figure is mostly warm, except for just a little bit of a, sh of a cape she's wearing, I guess, and his shirt. But the rest of their clothing and obviously the human skin tones are always warm. The modeling is very sharp and realistic uh, on the clothing. And of course, I would say the clouds are very strong modeling. And of course, the city walls a little bit softer because they're further away. Uh, but on her body, very strong modeling. And, and of course, all the cement texture is very strong, very realistic, as is true of all Renaissance painting. And that is uh, obvious in the foreground on the two human figures and um, their skin, their hair, the, the dirt beneath her feet, even all the way back to the horizon with the city walls, very strong um, <clears throat> uh, simulated textures and modeling both. Okay, I think we've covered everything here on this one. So now we're going to get to the two most important slides, some would say, of the whole evening. Hang on, we didn't get to the end. That's a church I cut from the study list, by the way, if you're curious. It's an interesting, I've been there, it's a very interesting church, but we got to get to the two most important slides of this week's lecture. So take very thorough notes on these, on both of them, and I will answer questions because there are conflicting theories about the meaning of both of these two very famous paintings. But let's start with the fact that both of the last two slides, uh, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper, are high renaissance so there's your last definition for tonight so let me give you that and i'll say it slowly and repeat it high renaissance is the period from circa remember circa little c that's a useful thing but you won't have to uh, use that term to get an a on the midterm uh, or, or if it's on the syllabus, you can just write the date the way it is, rounded to a zero without putting the little C or circa in front of it. I think I've told you that already. But I, I use it because historians always do. <laughs> so what is that uh, definition again for high Renaissance? Here we go. It's a period from circa 1480 to 1520 during the Italian Renaissance. It's a long definition. Nah, not that long, it's too long. Uh, it's a period from circa 1480 to 1520 during the Italian Renaissance, comma, during which the greatest artists of the Renaissance, during which the greatest artists of the Renaissance created their, their best and most uh, famous works, created their best and most famous works. Well, that's exactly what we're going to see this week and all next week. I mean, these last two slides and then on into all through next week. <clears throat> so these last two must know slides or, or, or paintings are both high Renaissance. OK, so let's start with the Lady Mona Lisa. Let's start with the fact that's not the correct name of this painting. If you go to see it, everyone knows it's at the Louvre, right, in Paris. I think that's common knowledge. Uh, you'll see, anybody here been to the Louvre? Anybody? Paris? Boy, it's a museum. At some point, if you're interested in art after you finish this class or any time in the future, you want to go there once in your life and spend, don't think you can see it in one day. Give yourself three days at least. You can't even see it in two weeks if you, if you had that much time. But certainly, this is the most famous painting in, no one would argue with that, in the world the most easily recognizable painting in the world. I've seen prints of it all over every country I've been to practically when I've been in people's homes that have art prints or in you know, uh, shops and things, you know, everywhere from China to the West Bank of uh, Palestine to Cuba. I mean, I've seen you know, Russia, of course. Uh, it does not only Europeans and Americans that admire it. It's a world renowned work of art. Why? Because of the mystery behind the meaning and because of two new techniques that da Vinci used for the first time on this painting. So you see why we can't rush through this. It's a lot of meaning to this painting. But let's just start out with the fact that the name of it is La Gioconda. That's the correct name. If you go to the Louvre, they're so tired of hearing Americans say, where's the Mona Lisa, that they went ahead and put a sign up with an arrow pointing to where the Mona Lisa is. But that's not what it's called. It never was. It's La Gia Conda, G-I-A, 
C-O-N-D-A, meaning the wife of Gia Kondo. She was his fiance. We know who she was. There's no mystery there. And we know why it was painted. Yeah. Um, Welcome. Yeah, you missed just the very early part, but we're, but you could see we're on Mona Lisa, right? That's obviously the most famous painting. We're just starting the meeting, so you 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 got uh, you didn't miss too much. Okay, so what we're saying is that this is a famous portrait of a real woman, and we know who she was, and her name was Giaconda. That's her last name. That's how women were. They were always given the name because there was no women's liberation back then. They were given just the last name of their husband with uh, the female ending in Italian, of course. So it's Giaconda married to Miss to Senor Giacondo, okay, with an O on the end of his name. He commissioned da Vinci to por paint a portrait of his fiance. There's no debate over that. I know there's some people who think it's a self-portrait of da Vinci. That's ludicrous. <laughs> it's not. We have the receipts there. There's even a letter or two between the man, Miss Senor, I keep saying Mr. Senor, Giacondo, the man who pay, hired da Vinci to paint his future wife, this woman who Americans for some strange reason call Mona Lisa, which has nothing to do with the original meaning, but we'll, we'll keep using that phrase because that's what it is in all American books. So we'll say Mona Lisa. So here we have this woman uh, who was about to get married to a rich and powerful uh, businessman named Giacondo. And we don't know why, but he rejected the painting. These are the facts that you should be writing that no one disputes. The evidence, the written records prove these certain facts. The mystery comes in after the painting was finished. And I'll explain what those mysteries are in a minute. Some of you already know about various things about her appearance. But, but what we do know is that he, Giocondo, the guy that commissioned the painting by da Vinci of his future wife, didn't like it. The fool, <laughs> said, well, that was a bad decision to reject this painting. It's the most valuable painting in the world. Some people say it's worth half a billion dollars. It's certainly a quarter of a billion. That's a conservative estimate and no one can afford to insure it. It's been stolen twice from the Louvre and recovered. Long time ago, like last century, uh, like a hundred years ago, twice in a few years, it was stolen and, and returned luckily. Uh, so it's the most valuable work of art or painting, I just say, on earth. No, nobody argues with that. So this guy rejects this very valuable, unique painting for some reason. And da Vinci, this is the last fact that we don't dispute, that everyone knows is true, kept it with him the rest of his life and took it when he traveled all around Western Europe. He was so famous, he was invited to stay in princes and king's palaces all over Europe. He chose to only go accept a few of those. And when he died, he was in Paris, living in the Louvre. I think everyone knows the Louvre was never an art museum. Napoleon changed it into a museum. It had been the palace for centuries of the French kings. Whenever they were in Paris, they lived at the Louvre. So that's how it ended up being in France instead of Italy, because he had it with him and he was living as a guest of the King of France when he died and he willed it to the people of France or maybe the King himself. And then that King donated it to um, the future museum. So those are the facts that we know. What about the mysteries? Well, one reason is we don't know one mystery. I mean, is we don't know the reason why Mr. or Senor Giocondo, the man who commissioned it, rejected it. Nobody knows, but the theories start there. The mystery, you could say, starts there. One theory is that she was having an affair with da Vinci, but there's a big problem with that. We don't have any doubt now even 30, 40 years ago, there was some debate, but everyone now agrees Da Vinci was openly gay. And again, he could have been punished severely. Anything from being exiled to imprisoned uh, for that openly gay lifestyle. But there's no debate about that. So him having an affair with her, very unlikely. Possible, but unlikely. That theory has mostly been rejected. Another theory is she was hiding pain because she didn't want to marry the smile. In other words, that's where the mystery uh, is focused. You know, why is she have this? I don't know if you agree it's a mysterious smile, but actually the more you look at it, the more it does look like it could mean the difference between her expression and what a happy soon to be married future wife might be thinking. So another theory is that she uh, was in love with someone else, not to mention 
and uh, she was being forced to marry. Well, that happened all the time in upper class Renaissance Italy. Well, even the lower classes, but especially upper class. Marriages are almost all arranged. Not just royalty, that's a given. You had no choice who you were going to marry if you were a king or queen. Well, you did if you were Henry VIII, but <laughs> he was an exception. So, but basically, she probably, we know, was, was, was required. You could say forced or, or arranged, anyway, the marriage. So maybe she didn't love him and she was sad. She was hiding her sadness, her broken heart, because she really loved someone else. That's a fairly credible theory, but we don't have any evidence for that. Any more than the, the other two or three theories. Another, I told you a few uh, slides back before the break, another theory that's I, it's totally ludicrous, but some historians actually wrote a book saying it's Da Vinci, a self-portrait of him, self in drag. Mm, there's absolutely no evidence, not even circumstantial for that. It doesn't make any sense, but that's just the theory they were trying to get a book published, I guess. But it's out there. Some people might believe that. Um, it doesn't look anything like Da Vinci, though, so that makes no sense. Another theory is that she'd had a miscarriage, which after all, there was premarital, <laughs> obviously premarital sex uh, all the way back to the beginning of the human race. So could she have had a miscarriage before the wedding? Of course, it's quite possible she could have gotten pregnant. Then they decided to get married before she, you know, showed. And maybe she had had, you know, uh, obviously a tragic event right before or shortly before they were meant to get married. No, nobody knows. Uh, the theories are, there's many more even about the fact that she's uh, perhaps just being coy and flirting with Da Vinci, which could easily be the case, even though she might've known he was gay or maybe not, he didn't advertise that, but anyone who knew him knew he was gay and all the ruling classes knew he was. The church officials knew he was. I'm talking about in uh, Florence, where he was at the time he painted this. He moved all over. He never stayed in one city more than a few years. He was, he was a gypsy, a nomad, <laughs> and he never had any money. He almost never had money or very little money. I'm sorry, that was, I, I just suddenly realized I was looking away from the screen. Was there someone who had a, a question or no, no, they would say if I need to admit someone else who just joined us, right? Okay, sorry. So let's wrap up with the meaning and just uh, then talk about, oops, two more facts. The meaning overlaps into the formal analysis now. I've said that a couple of times. So in this slide, you really have to to think like that, if it's on, as I say, as a high possibility, I would say even probability of being on the midterm, that this, besides being a high Renaissance painting, introduced, let's just say it's the first Da Vinci painting, or even you could rephrase that and say one of the first famous paintings ever to use two new techniques. Now, some historians claim Da Vinci invented one or both of these techniques. There's very little proof on the first one, but most historians think he did invent the second one and he used it first on this painting. So I'll repeat that. It's the last part of the meeting now that this painting displays two new techniques that Da Vinci used for the first time together, you know, both in one painting on this painting. And therefore, many historians believe he invented one or both of those techniques. So what are they? The next two definitions, flip your, your list of terms over to the second page. You see them at the top of the next page. We'll do them, I'll repeat them, say them once and say, repeat them, say them slowly, since you, you'll need to write them. And they're, you know, not very short definitions, but, but once you know what they are, you'll be able to recognize them. Uh, two, okay, raised hands. All right, go ahead there. That's what I missed before. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the network was uh, not good for my side, but uh, I need to know the name of the woman, please, and uh, the name of drawer, and what type of pen. Do you have a bad is connection? Is that what's happening? Yeah. I understand. All right, I'll say them slowly again. It's, uh, we're going to say Mona Lisa, but her real name, now that's on your syllabus, so I don't need to spell that. Uh, her real name was Gioconda, G-I-O-C-O-N-D-A. That was her married name. She married a man named Giocondo. And when a woman married a man, she took his last name. And in Italian, you put the A at the end. You may know this if you know about foreign languages, mm -hmm. right? In Spanish, it's the same thing, right? So, so, so her real name was uh, La Gioconda, but everyone in America calls her Mona Lisa. The artist... Mm -hmm. Well, Da Vinci. Now, that's a word I hope you've all seen. It's about, I'll spell it for you. Two words, of course, his last name, Da Vinci, D-A, and then capital V-I-N-C-I. 
Leonardo, of course, Da Vinci, obviously, but you don't have to know the first name of any of these artists. And the name of Groa? I just said it. <laughs> oh, okay. I just said it. I'll say it one more time. We got to move on. Da Vinci, the most famous painter, one of the two most famous in the history of the world, probably. Yeah, thank right? you. Da Vinci, yeah. two words, right? D A and then V I N C I. Okay, sorry, I want to make sure you got that. Okay, it's on your it's on your syllabus though too. Remember that you should have right in front of you. Do you have your syllabus? I need to ask because if you don't, then these questions are kind of like uh, counter productive because <laughs> the syllabus has the spelling on them but i always spell them at the beginning but then usually mm -hmm. only once okay from now on all right mm -hmm. let us let us now talk about those two techniques this is really important these will come up on the midterm i guarantee one or both sfumato again i'm not spelling the words that are on your list of terms you've got them in front of you uh that's that's every student's you know uh, uh responsibility sfumato here we go that definition is a technique uh, in painting where an artist uses a, a wash, okay, applies is a better word, okay, I'll start over. It's a technique of painting in which the artist applies a wash, just like the word wash, over part or all of a painting, comma, over part or all of a painting, and that's what you see here. That's got sfumato there and there behind her head, which creates a smoky, hazy effect. That's the reason they use it. It creates a smoky, hazy effect. I'll say the whole definition one more time uh, all the way through. Uh, sfumato is a technique of painting in which an artist applies a wash, you know, that means some kind of chemical, right? Over part or all of a painting, comma, which creates a smoky, hazy effect. It's meant to convey distance or something further away from the viewer. And sometimes it's used on objects just behind the main subject, which is the woman, her, there she is, Mona Lisa, or now we know her real name is Giaconda. But everything behind her has fumato, even the closest part. See, it's a kind of smoky, hazy look. It gets more and more pronounced, so that means Da Vinci probably put more of that wash over. I don't know what kind of chemical it was, and I'm not a painter, so some of you know if you've done this technique in your art classes. But he would have applied more sfumato as, it, as the landscape gets further away from the viewer. So the, the sfumato technique is on the, uh, the, the whole scene behind her, the landscape, everything beyond the balcony, okay? The other technique is even easier to, uh, harder to pronounce and spell and easier to recognize. And that's chiaroscuro. Sorry, these Italian names, they sound like names of ice cream flavors. Somebody said one of my classes. It's nothing to do with ice cream. Chiaroscuro. Um, uh, that one I'll spell for you, you know, but you should, you, you have it in front of you. So really I shouldn't have to, right? It's uh, the way it, it's pronounced. So, so it's on your list of terms. It's the second one down. So here we go. That definition is a technique in painting in which an artist uses highly contrasting areas all the way around her hands. You see that and her arms. It's a technique in painting in which an artist uses highly contrasting areas of light and dark to create the illusion of three dimensions, to create the illusion of three dimensions. You see it around her chin, even her nose, and especially her cheeks. You notice that, 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 that this is darker than you might normally see in a portrait. It's a daytime portrait done outdoors. We know where it was painted. It was painted in the city of Florence. We know where her studio was. So the background's totally imaginary, but the balcony and her and the way she's dressed and her hair, that's all real. We know that's how she really looked. Okay, so he's using, I'll say it one more time, that second definition, chiaroscuro, is a technique for painting in which an artist uses highly contrasting areas of light and dark to create the illusion of three dimensions. Well, let's see up close how that looks. So that's, you can, you can put your pen down for a moment and just look. 
I have close up. See it around her face, even, even around the lips somewhat, but especially noticeable under the nose, around the eyes. You see how much more three dimensional. Now look, this painting is over 500 years old and it's been stolen twice. That's part of the meaning you could write. It was stolen two different times in the early 1900s from the Louvre, can you believe it? The most highly guarded museum in the world. I don't know how, again, someone must have planned it from inside the, the museum or something. But anyway, at both times the, the painting was returned, but damaged. Uh, the cracks, you see the crack in the painting on her forehead and cheeks? That probably had something to do with the painting being rolled up by the thieves and stored in a wall behind some furniture. <laughs> That's where it was found in the thieves apartment. And it was in Belgium. They got all the way across the border of France. You have to write all that, but it's an interesting, you could find documentaries. You definitely would for extra credit for 10 points. If you've watched one about this, the, the history of this painting, uh, one hour or more, you get to, uh, I'm sorry, 10, 10 points. If you write two pages about what you learn from a documentary, that would be an interesting subject for some people at least. The, the story of this painting, not just how it was created originally, but what happened to it after that. Okay, so you see, uh, you see this, uh, sorry, Chiara screw around her eyes, her forehead, her cheeks, her chin. And then you also, you see it here with a crack, crackling effect. You also see it on her hands. And I, I took these uh, close-ups when I was, I was in there at the Louvre. I was able to get these close-ups. It's really nice. I'd have a telephoto. You can't get close. Anybody here seen the Mona Lisa? You can't get very close to it. You can get reasonably close, <clears throat> but there's always about 50 or more people around it. And it's a glass case to protect it in front of it from tourist breath, right? So I think you can get within like maybe eight feet, six or eight feet. There's a rope to keep you further away. But if you have a good camera and with no flashes are allowed, telephoto. In fact, you know what? I don't even know if they let you take pictures anymore. I was there in the 90s. Maybe, maybe that rule's changed. But I wanted to capture. You see the chiara scuro between the fingers? You see what I'm talking about? And around the edges of her hand and the whole background of her dress behind her two hands or her arms uh, is so dark that that's an extreme example of chiara scuro. Uh, many people think, just say many historians think, that Da Vinci invented this technique. This is the first famous painting to use chiaroscuro. Sumato had been used a little before, but he could have invented both. Okay, let's go back then. Now it's plenty on the meaning here. Wasn't there like a common conception that the Mona Lisa was a lot bigger than it actually is? Too? Yes, yes, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. It, anybody know how small it is? Not exactly, but roughly compared to, say, you know, famous scenes from, uh, you know, battles or the Bible or, or, or even um, the, the, the birth of Venus. That's a huge painting. It takes up almost half a wall. It's tiny. It's small enough that I, I don't even know if you, I think it's barely life size. In fact, no, it's even smaller. Yeah. Her, her body, the part of her upper body that you see is not even life size. It's very small. It's, it's, it's like oh gosh well with the frame it might be three feet not even two and a half feet across and maybe four feet tall three to four feet it, it's not a large painting that you're right absolutely surprises people when they first get there every time i've seen this painting just a quick i've seen it four times paris is my favorite city <laughs> been there many, many times when i go there i don't always go to the Louvre because i've been there so many times but when i have friends that are visiting or even my french friends that live in paris and want to maybe go back after they've been there in on a school field trip or something when they were growing up the people that live in paris rarely react this way but visitors for the first time when they see this painting it almost always brings tears to their eyes i'm not exaggerating there's something about it that's just so powerful emotionally and, and uh, such a mystery. Okay, let's do the formal analysis. And then we have one more very important painting, the last one for tonight, which is the Last Supper. Okay, is it balanced? Oh yeah, of course. But some people make the case that, well, look, there's more space between her shoulder and the uh, right edge of the painting than the left. So if you want to technically be that, you know, detailed, you could say it's slightly unbalanced because of her body's positioning, slightly unbalanced towards the right. Uh, top to bottom, of course, the sky, most people don't think of that as having mass. So if you look at that as empty, then you'd have to say it is, again, somewhat unbalanced toward the bottom. It has overlapping, obviously. Here's foreshortening. You see it on the balcony, right, that she's sitting in front of uh, or on <laughs> uh, at the balcony wall. And then her shoulders 
and I would even say a little bit on the landscape. So there's foreshortening, overlapping, diminishing size on the rocks, right? They get smaller the further back you go, and definitely scientific and atmospheric perspective. The atmospheric perspective is there even without the application of sfumato. It would be a blue hazy look on those rocks in the background without sfumato. And then when you add the sfumato on top of the paint, right, after the paint dries, you put the wash on, that you get even a more pronounced effect of distance. You know, air, aerial, some people call it, but atmospheric is our preferred term. Atmospheric perspective is definitely present, as is a vanishing point, no question that. It has all the techniques used to depict space uh, in uh, Renaissance art. She's the largest mass, then the balcony, and then I guess you could say the road or some of the rocks, depending on how you break it down. It's almost all stable on her, although the way, you know, of course, the top of her head, all human beings, the heads, the top parts of their heads are, are dynamic to a some degree, but her arms are pretty close to being almost right angles across her uh, lap was the chair. Yeah, she's sitting in a chair. Um, I would say she's mostly stable with the exception, of course, of the outer edges of her head, the top of her forehead and so forth. The landscape is, is mostly dynamic. So it's a mixture. The lines here are thin. He didn't use much bold outline. Yeah, some people think that's that's bold outline. No, that's shadows. Remember, we saw it up close uh, that, that he's using for that technique of Castro. So all the lines, the outlines are thin. Uh, here uh, you have, uh, let's see, the rhythm, of course, of the, of the rocks in the background and her hands, her fingers, her face, lots of rhythm. Uh, the colors are warm on her all of it, everything her skin tones her hair her clothing and the bottom half of the landscape is more warm than cool but once you get to the water from there up to the sky it's mostly cool and then the semi texture and the modeling i already mentioned the modeling kiara school is a kind of modeling by definition so very strong powerful modeling specifically kiara school all the way around her her face and her her hands and uh, there is modeling on her clothing and, and, and soft or diffuse modeling on the landscape. Strong modeling on her. And all the cement textures you get on her are sharp, realistic textures on her hair, her skin, her clothing. Soft and diffused cement textures on the rocks and the water. Okay, we're doing pretty well on time. I think we are going to still be able to end about 15 minutes early, but I don't want to rush through this. I'm going to show you a couple more where you don't have to write anything for the next two or three minutes. This is called the Madonna of the Rocks. There's a mystery to this painting too, because it's Da Vinci, the next three or four Da Vinci's. Um, there's only about 50 or 60 Da Vinci paintings. We don't know if he ever painted more, maybe as many as 100, that the rest of which are either not yet discovered. They just discovered a new one. You notice that, everybody, last year, valued immediately at $150 million. <laughs> I think it was in Poland or somewhere. Anyway, in someone's you know collection somewhere. Uh, but this is in one of the British museums. I forget which one. Uh, and it's typically uh, ex extreme chaotic girl. Look at the dark background. And then the only sfumato is in the grotto. So it's called the Madonna of the Grotto. So the grotto has sfumato, right? <laughs> you don't have to write that because it's not on the syllabus. And it's a scene with Mary in the blue, you don't have to know this, but uh, with um, her son, Jesus, their cousins here, th these two, uh, and, and this is uh, her nephew. Uh, so you see how the sfumato, not the sfumato, the chiaroscuro was used. And then here you got sfumato in the background. This is, uh, again, the same two figures, but a very different pose. And that is Jesus playing with the baby lamb as, as a baby. Uh, and the background has that sfumato and the two figures around their faces, especially the one uh, that some people think might be the same model. It's just that she has similar features to the Mona Lisa model. But uh, I, I'm sure she didn't pose for more than one painting, uh, which would be the portrait that her husband commissioned and then didn't accept. And then my favorite, it really is, is this powerful woman. Now, see, he was close friends, Da Vinci, and had kind of platonic, uh, some say even platonic romances. That's Some people think it's an oxymoron. That What does that mean? If you have a platonic friendship, it's not a romance. But, you know, he wrote very passionate letters of respect, admiration, and affection, those things, to strong, powerful, beautiful women all over Europe that he knew from when he either painted their portrait because it was commissioned 
you know, their husband or someone, or uh, he knew them through some other connection in the art world. And he stayed friends with those kind of, and once in a while, if he visited the city they lived in, they would host him as, as a house guest. So he had good close relationships with a number of, of, of women, and many of whom he painted. But as far as we know, no romantic relationships with, with females, only males. Okay, but look at the look at the expression in her face. And this Kiara girl, it's just total blackness, isn't it? But he wants you to see the intelligent, you know, uh, you know focused expression on her face. And you know his sense of admiration and respect for her uh, qualities, uh, which he captured brilliant. Okay, now we get to our last must note. This is a really important one. You should take very thorough notes. Okay, this is the Last Supper. Now I know everyone can spell those words, three words, the Last Supper. And Da Vinci, I've already spelled his name, of course, the same artist as obviously as Mona Lisa. The date of this is 1498. So this is high Renaissance, just like the Mona Lisa was, by one of the greatest artists of the uh, Italian Renaissance, obviously Da Vinci. Some consider him the first high Renaissance painter, but you, you don't have to write that. But let's talk about what this is first, the context of the for the meaning. It's a fresco on the wall of a monastery in Milan, Italy. You could just say in Italy, but the city it's, is in is Milan. And it depicts a scene from the Bible. Some of you already know this, but if you don't, you should be writing it. It depicts a scene from the Bible in which Jesus had his last supper, literally, his last um, meeting or time, you could say, the last meal with all of his disciples. And then in, and then in, in, well, then, of course, and now again, Israel, right? Uh, it was in then a Roman colony called Israel. It's just literally the last thing he did before he was arrested by the Romans and tried and executed, of course. A few days later, he was dead. So it's a powerful moment in the history of the Bible, of Christian religion, and much of art, at least Western art, of course, depicts this scene. There have been hundreds and hundreds, if not maybe thousands of versions of The Last Supper. This is the most famous for very good reasons, because it has several things that no other artist had tried to include in a scene depicting this meal, this last meal. We'll start with the fact that da Vinci was uh, a, an artist who used two techniques, two, they call them signature motifs. I would even write that phrase, but if you don't want to use that phrase, you can just say techniques that he invented or that he always used to depict the emotions of his main figures. He, he came up with two new techniques that are in this painting when it was a group scene, right? Not just a portrait to depict the uh, inner thoughts and feelings of his uh, main figures. One of them was body language. That's Jesus. Look at his hands. He's giving up. Well, that's not the right phrase. He's resigned. He knows he's going to be dead in a few days and that someone betrayed him in that room. Someone in that group had already uh, be become, a, well, you want to say a traitor, uh, betrayed him to the Romans. The Romans were on their way to arrest him, in fact, according to this scene in the Bible. So he's accepting. You could say resignation is a word I'd use. And that shows in his body language, the placement of his arms and hands and even his face. But the other technique is the facial features, which display combined or together, I should say, together with the body language. So those are the two things he did. The, the, the facial expressions, very powerful, strong emotions, and the body language or poses of his figures would reveal their inner thoughts and feelings much, much more clearly than any painter before. He's famous for doing those two things together. And all these figures have those qualities. We see their emotional state of mind by both their body language. Look at them. They're reacting like this guy here. That's Peter, right? The first and oldest disciple. He's literally raising his hand. Why? Because Jesus just said, one of you has betrayed me. That's an important detail about the meaning. It depicts this painting, the moment in which Jesus told all of his disciples he knew one of them had betrayed him to the Romans. And that he forgave that person too, which is a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? So this is Peter saying, no, it can't be. You know, you can say shock or denial, right? This guy here saying that can't be true. None of us would do this. 
we love you. You know, they're all reacting. And then I said, what did he say? Right. You, you can get the point is that these people are reacting in utter shock and surprise, if not uh, even denial about what they just heard. They heard from their beloved teacher, because that's basically how they saw him as a teacher, uh, who just now told them he's about to be arrested because one of them betrayed him. And none of them think it, it, it could, couldn't possibly be any of us. But there is one person here who isn't surprised, and that's Judas, the guy that, according to the Bible, was the person who betrayed Jesus, who, who turned him into the Romans. He's even got his purse, if you look closely here, with the, the money that the Romans gave him for betraying Jesus. So Jesus knows that that's the guy that betrayed him, Judas. And he's the only one, Judas, that's not reacting with surprise. So there again, the body language, the expressions reveal the inner thoughts and feelings. Okay, another thing, though, that's important to mention, because if you study da Vinci, you might not know this, but if you study them, you should. There are people who would look at this, and I definitely believe it should be, you know, upfront about this. The only person with the darker skin color in this painting is the guy that is the traitor, the, the one who betrayed Jesus. Now, if you might logically, I totally could, could understand, because the first time I saw this, I've seen it twice in, in real life, I might have started to think, well, wait a minute, maybe that's a, you know, a little bit of racism there, or overtly racist. No, not when it comes to da Vinci. I'll tell you why. We know that he didn't have any idea in his mind of depicting the one betrayer in the room to be of a different race. First of all, they were all Jewish. They were all Middle Eastern. And that's one fact. But more important is da Vinci himself, he never had any racist or sexist attitudes. He believed prejudice. In fact, he would write in his notebooks for years and years and years about how stupid human prejudice was of any kind because he believed people should study. And he did uh, cultures and history and, and, and peoples from all over the world. That was what he was all about. He, some people call him the first modern scientist because he, he had no prejudice. In fact, he actually said in not so many words, but in the gist of his philosophy about prejudice and, and discrimination and racism was that uh, human prejudices are a waste of human potential and therefore stupid and self-defeating. So he wasn't a racist. That's not what's going on. So then the question is, why did he depict one of them, the guy that was the, the villain in this scene, uh, with a different skin tone because of ancient Greek and Roman theater if you study that period, you'll see what I mean. In ancient theater, all the way up through at least early 20th century plays, uh, not only Greek ones, but you know, ever since the earliest plays, which were invented by the Greeks, were the first people to do plays, right? 2,500 years ago. The villain is shown with a different lighting on stage to identify him or her. It, it, it had nothing to do with their ethnic or racial background. It was just a way of identifying. Uh, the figure that was the person who was, you know, the, the, the bad guy versus, it's not about the racial or ethnic composition, not at all, not, not with Da Vinci and not with this, uh, this scene. Okay, so what we see here are all of his disciples, and there's one more controversy, and it has to do with uh, sexual identity. Is that a man or a woman? It's the last part of the meaning I'm going to uh, you know, there is a debate that rages, it has for four, no, five centuries. There's two theories. One is it's a male who happens to have long hair and would have been then probably one of the youngest disciples. I don't remember if it's James or just say one of the younger disciples who might have had long hair and perhaps a slightly effeminate face. The other theory is it's the other Mary. That's what I believe. The other Mary. So it's the last part of the meaning. That means Mary Magdalene. And I will spell that for you, but you don't have to worry about the spelling. Remember, you won't get points off of any word that you might write in your papers or on the exams that isn't on the syllabus. If a word is in the syllabus, you do have to spell correctly. And you'll have the syllabus in front of you, of course, during the test, and along with your notes and books. So I will spell Mary Magdalene, the first name I have, of course, everyone knows how to spell Mary Magdalene, M-A-G-D-E-L-A-I-N-E. -E. She is the only female disciple. She was the 13th disciple. And now here is a case of sexism. She was written out of the Bible, not the whole Bible, but out of the rewriting of it. I'm sorry, I meant the writing. 
there are four books in the Bible, and they're all you know male uh, disciples of Jesus, right? That wrote their version of his life, including his death. She wrote a version, and the Catholic Church expelled or expunged that or removed it from the Bible when it was finally printed in Latin, I think a couple hundred years later. And we just say so many decades or generations after this event, uh, Mary's version of this day and his crucifixion, all of his you know whole life was cut out of the original version of the Bible. So that's why many historians, myself included, think this is probably the only female disciple and some think they might have had romantic relationship, but there's no evidence for that. We do know that there was such a disciple. She existed. All these people were real people. This is, you know, some people think it was all made up. No, they were all real people. The Romans kept records when they arrested people. They went ahead and arrested some of the other disciples after they killed Jesus as his collaborators because he was, you know, threatening their empire, supposedly. Uh, so that's why, of course, they killed him. And then they arrested, I think it was three or four of the other disciples were also crucified after Jesus. So, so these people were all taking risks. And Mary Magdalene was always shown in other works of, of art about Jesus and his disciples as on his right hand, that she, some say, was his favorite disciple. Being the only female disciple, that's why some people think there might have been some kind of secret romance between them, but that's just a theory. Well, now that's a lot about the meaning, but there's one last fact. Look at what happened to this painting if you go back to, see, these are my own slides I took when I was there in 2000. They had just restored it. These are close-ups of the, this, this maybe is Mary Magdalene, and here's Peter again, and here's uh, Judas, and then we'll see Jesus in the middle, and the other disciples, Michael and I don't know, David, there's several other disciples. Uh, the point is that this painting is a restoration of the original because the original was so, as the last fact of the meaning you might want to write, so badly damaged that it had to be restored. In fact, this is after it was restored and the lighting of course here is a professional lighting. You cannot take a picture like this. You are not allowed to use flash or tripods or get closer than 15 feet from the statue. You are allowed to take pictures with a non-flash camera. So if you had your digital camera, you could if you were there, uh, but you won't get the lighting very well, uh, very accurately, as you can see from my painting, uh, I mean, sorry, my photos. But what happened is that the painting was so badly deteriorated because of the uh, fixative, fixative, you could just say the chemical that da Vinci used was an experimental chemical to make it seal. It's a fresco, I already said that. So it's sealed into the wall but it didn't stay that way. It started deteriorating within a few years after it was finished. And if no restoration was ever done, it would be gone by now, except for very faint outlines and maybe a few places where you could see a face. So it's been restored multiple times, but badly restored. So here's how you summarize that last fact about the meaning in one or two sentences. This painting had been restored multiple times because of the ongoing damage. You don't have to say why, over the centuries. Most recently though, the most accurate restoration was done at the end of the 20th century. It took 15 years and $15 million and it took the eyesight, I'm not exaggerating, it made blind the woman who did the restoration because it were thousands of tiny pieces of paint that she had to pick out of the wall that were left over to get the colors and then reproduce them at a lab and then go back and put them on. You can see it's not solid strokes of paint the way it originally would have been. They, she didn't want to do that. That would be her redoing a, a masterpiece. She went blind. And I saw the interview with her. You have to write this part. At the entrance, you get to see a documentary and it's in multiple languages. So I understood the English version. She was interviewed on uh, Italian TV, uh, Madam so-and-so, you, you uh, became uh, blind, you lost your eyesight by the time you finished this restoration. If you knew that was going to happen before you took that job, would you have done it? And she said, absolutely. It's the labor of love I've wanted to do all my life. She's willing to give up her eyesight to restore a painting. That's dedication. Okay, let's do the formal analysis and we'll still end several minutes early. But before we do that, Anybody have any questions about anything? Because that is a lot of stuff. You're not going to have to remember more than six 
or maybe if you want to six or seven, maybe eight sentences if you want to be more thorough. But on the exam, the requirements for the essay answers uh, of the uh, three slides that you'll, you'll need to describe the meaning of uh, would be just six facts out of what did I give you about three times that many. Any questions now though? Now's a good you, time. You said the most accurate restoration was in the last 15 yes. years? Yes, last yes. It was years. done between 1985, you have to know the years, but it was finished in 2000. I was there. I was there as a guest of the Italian tourism ministry. I'm very lucky because I was there all by myself with one guide. And of course, he was there to make sure I didn't get too close and breathe on it. So I got closer than most people, but I still couldn't get, you know, only that, 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 so you can see this from these pictures. I got closer than the person who took this picture, right? But it was still with a rope of somewhere. I think he lifted the rope and said, you can take two more steps and don't go any further. I, I, it, was, I was, it was a mystical experience to see this and know, can you see, you don't have to write in this now. We'll finish with the formal analysis and we'll still end about 9.15 because it's so, but look at the paint that woman who restored it, who lost her eyesight, what she was doing, she was picking little with tweezers, you know, very small instruments, maybe the smallest tweezers you can imagine, little tiny flecks of paint from 500 years ago that da Vinci was, had put on the painting that hadn't been you know lost in the previous restorations that were still there first they got rid of all the other over layers if you're curious how that worked of the bad restorations over the last several centuries they they carefully got all the way down to what was left of all uh, not a lot but in each figure there was see here this one there wasn't much left so she didn't even try to recreate much of the color just sort of the overall shades but on jesus and on this disciple here and, and this guy here she was able to find enough pieces of paint to recreate most of the original colors. They had to go to a special lab where the paint was produced the way it was in the 1500s, or sorry, 14, late 1400s. Oh, by the way, this building was bombed by the Germans in World War II, or was it the Allies? I can't remember which. Was, there was a war right between the uh, Nazis who occupied Italy and the US and British forces that were liberating Italy, and it almost got destroyed. That's when the cracks, some think the cracks occurred, but I don't know if that's true. Uh, I'm not really sure of that. The cracks could have come at any time during the centuries that this painting has been standing. We're lucky that that whole wall didn't collapse in, during World War II. Uh, and also that there was a woman willing to risk her eyesight to, or not risk, to, to give up her eyesight, lose it, to restore it. But this is how it looks when you stand further away and the lighting is, is even on it, uh, if you were to go see it now. It, this is the restored version. She did a really good job when you think about it. It's pretty amazing that uh, she could even do it at all. Yeah, okay. Any other questions about the, the painting itself before we do wrap it up with the formal analysis and we'll end it right about 9.15 here. All right, it is completely balanced, of course. You've got an equal number of figures on either side of Jesus and him in the middle. And then you have the two walls. It is very carefully balanced and the ceiling and the table and the floor beneath the table, by the way, that's a doorway, <laughs> which has been blocked. It used to lead into the, uh, this was the dining hall. This was on the wall of the dining hall. There we go, on the wall of the dining hall where the monks ate. They looked at this painting every day. It's kind of appropriate or fitting, isn't it? That the scene they looked at was a supper scene for hundreds of years until uh, it's no longer a monastery. It's just a museum now just for this one painting the whole museum is dedicated to the history of this painting the restoration the meaning of it okay so then we have the rhythm of the pieces of food mostly bread you know and cheese i guess on the table maybe some fruit the arms hands legs heads obviously a lot of rhythm including the windows right and uh doorways i guess are openings in the wall uh and then we have is it stable or dynamic it is mostly stable well it's both. It's stable on Jesus, but mostly dynamic on the uh, disciples, except maybe Peter, his hands are somewhat dynamic, but he is kind of upright. And I guess you could say this man at the end of the table, but most of the disciples are dynamic. The table is stable <laughs> and the walls are stable, but because of the angle we're looking at, the walls appear right to be at a diagonal, even though they're straight, obviously. So, so it has a, a dynamic uh, feeling to it, even though it's really at least equally stable and dynamic in different parts. And then we have the rhythm. Oh, I already mentioned rhythm. Oh, it's similar texture again. Now it's, it's a bit soft here in the restoration because of what I just explained to how the restoration was done. But originally it would have been a strong and realistic and you still see that on most of the faces. 
uh, modeling and uh, on the you know the bodies and the room itself, and then of course realistic as always, strong simulated textures on the hair, the skin, the tablecloth the food on the table, the walls. For space, it's got atmospheric perspective. You see it there in the mountains in the distance. It's beautifully done. That looks like the real landscape outside of uh, in Milan. And back then, Milan wasn't as big as it is. So you probably could have seen the mountains from this uh, monastery. Maybe even that very scene. It's beautifully done. Of course, it's got scientific perspective with a vanishing point behind Jesus's head. You can see the diagonal lines here on the walls and the ceiling. And foreshortening on the table, and the walls, diminishing size, yeah, the framing around the doorways gets smaller and smaller, the ceiling, so there's diminishing size, overlapping, foreshortening, atmospheric perspective, and scientific perspective. All the main techniques in Renaissance painting. The, the colors, of course, alternating warm and cool, both on Jesus' robes and warm on all the skin tones. And of course, cool on the blue robes, and most of the other robes uh, that aren't blue are warm tones, earth tones. And of course the room to me is cool. It's kind of a cool gray color, but it seems to have kind of overlapped here with a little bit of warm, but I think that may be just the fading of the, I don't think she spent as much time restoring the walls behind the figures. She, mostly she's restored all of the 13 human figures. Okay, and let's see, I already said thin outline, right? Around the main objects, um, and, uh, figures and the objects. Uh, and uh, let's see, dynamic state. Oh, the largest mass. Well, you decide. It's, you could say it's the room behind them, if you count that as one mass. Then the table, and then you decide. This group of disciples is one mass. If so, that they're almost equal with the other side of the table. And then Jesus would be the smallest mass, if you, if you see it that way. Okay, I think we have covered everything on this one. Pretty sure I didn't uh, miss anything. Okay, any questions now in general? Let me... Uh, uh, do the stop share unless you have a question about this painting before I uh, scroll away from the screen share anybody okay but I will stick around as always for general questions about you know extra credit uh, anything that we've covered tonight uh, or how how to write your papers I, I've covered that all but of course I think a couple people joined us late so you would need to see, oh, this is going to be posted on YouTube. It's the only lecture for this because next week I'll see you all in person. Don't forget, this is a one-off thing. And that will be at the usual time. I'll be able to start on time at 6.30 next Wednesday in 708 Adelaide. Uh, and the same rules apply. You know, you're supposed to keep your mask on. And, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about social distancing. There aren't enough uh, people to force us to sit too close to each other, of course. And... Uh, uh, and, and if it's not too cold, I'll probably have the windows open for circulation. By the way, I think it's something I, I feel positive about. There was no hand sanitizer in the hallway the first week. You notice that the first night of class, I complained and then it was there, you notice that? <laughs> if you wanna use it, it'll be there. Uh, well, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, they promised it would not be uh, put away in a closet during our class. Okay, anybody else? Any questions? about anything we covered tonight. All right, I'll see you all next Wednesday at 6.30. And thank you for your patience and your flexibility about this one-time Zoom class. It will be posted on YouTube if you want to review it, okay? All right. <laughs> what, what, is, what is that page on YouTube? Uh, this will be, I'll send you an email. It, I have my own channel on YouTube. It's called uh, Mark Wilson's SRJC. I put it in the email I sent you about this. So, okay, then I Right. But I'll send it again as a reminder. It'll be posted by Friday night. Uh, so yeah, you guys can watch it if you miss part of it or you want to just review. But obviously the rest of the classes are just real time live. So you do want to not miss any of the others if you're physically able to be there. I look forward to seeing you all in person one week from tonight at 7.08 and Lee at about by 6.30 or very close. Okay. Thank you. You guys have a good week. All did right. You, um, did you hear about that? The joke about the Last Supper that Jesus asked for a table for 24 so they could all sit on the same side. Oh, no, I haven't heard that. Wait a minute. I guess I'm t my mind's a little guacamole dip, as my dad would say. It's been a, a strange day. Say that again. <laughs> um, there, before I Thank saw you. this thing on the internet, that was saying that Jesus asked for a table for 24 so they could all sit on the same side of the table.
why am I missing that? That that makes me feel dense, and maybe I am as to I don't see the. <laughs> thanks, Jenna, for your comments and questions. Well, thanks everybody for your participation. I guess you could send me an email explaining. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's stupid. I should get the humor in it, and I'm trying to visualize. Wait it's a minute. because they're all sitting on the same side of the table, you know. Like usually, when you sit at a table, like you circle the table, right? But, but there's only all... twelve, any way you look at it. So how? I'm sorry, I'm missing something. This is funny, actually. <laughs> Just the fact that you put this out, I'm sure that the humor is obvious to most people. Right now, my mind is too fuzzy. <laughs> Okay, well, that we are going to, uh, good luck, we'll, we'll be in person for the rest, because that's what the class was advertised as, and what most people said they prefer. And I like doing both, frankly. I like them equally better than I thought I would, but I, if I didn't do any in person, I'd feel I'm missing something important. So we will all see each other in person next week. Anyway, if if you want, ex you know what? If you want five points extra credit, whoever told me that joke, I didn't see who it was. Was that you, Ben? It was uh, me, Felipe. Oh, Felipe. Oh, Felipe. Felipe, okay. <laughs> you you might put into a single paragraph or yeah, a couple. All right, I'll try. I, I'm trying to figure out how I visualize 12 disciples becoming twice that number and then all sitting side by side and how that's funny. <laughs> it is uh, in a way just to think okay. about the joke itself, but I don't get the visual. If I, if I find the um, the original context, like I'll just send you like a screenshot of it. Yeah. Oh, that would be definitely five points extra credit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll look for that. Okay. Any other urgent questions that you can always email me in between now and next week or wait till next week to ask me in person. All right. See you guys all mm -hmm. next uh, Wednesday. Okay. Good night. Right, good night. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Have a good weekend. Bye.